Welcome to another live stream episode here of the SitRub Podcast. I'm joined by Rasmus, and we are going to take a quick tutorial look at uh, some beginning level Panzer Leader. Um, again, we're kind of stretching the uh, definition of 80th anniversary. The battle that we're going to take a look at today took place on 13 May 1940. So we're still well within the 80th anniversary um, timeline as far as Case Yellow goes. Um, 80 years ago today, we're already halfway through Dunkirk. Uh, well, this is the third day. What we're looking at today here is the third day of uh, Case Yellow. So we're, you know, obviously we're a little bit behind. But again, you know, we're, we're in that same general time period, that, that German blitzkrieg of the West. Case Yellow into um, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France, and then later on we'll follow up with Case Red uh, as the Germans turn south and head toward Paris. But for now, we're looking at this battle here. This is sort of the phase two of the battle we looked at a couple weeks ago, so I won't go into the, you know, huge historical detail. Um, but to go over it super fast, the Germans have invaded uh, the Western Low Countries. They're trying to get into uh, France, and they're trying to cut off the northern wing of the Allied armies. So to that effect, Army Group B has launched into Holland and northern Belgium. They're the bait. Uh, some historians call them the Red Cape of the Matador. They invade into Holland and they invade into Belgium here, and their job is to trigger the Allied response plans. The Allied response plans are to send in the northern part of the uh, of the uh, French armies and the British Expeditionary Force, that's BEF. They go into Belgium from the French border. They weren't allowed to go into Belgium before the war started. Belgium was trying to stay neutral. Uh, that didn't work out terribly well for them. But their, their idea was to get the Belgians, I'm sorry, to get the French and the um, British to help out the Belgians come into Belgium and meet the Germans here. This only sort of puts their neck in the noose, because the real German attack comes slightly afterwards. That's this big armored smash out of the south through the Ardennes, up through um, uh, some of these famous battlefields that we're going to look at later on in the series. They eventually get to these channel ports, and they start to form the Dunkirk Pocket. Um, that plan from the Germans would not have worked if Army Group B had not sort of lured the Allies to come into Belgium and engage them in Belgium. I mention all that because some of these uh, engagements in Belgium are what we're going to look at here today. 16th Motorized Corps comes down here. They're met by some French uh, tanks. Uh, two divisions of light mechanized divisions. These are kind of the closest things the French have to armored divisions in 1940. Uh, they come in, they're part of uh, Preu's Cavalry Corps, that's why I was getting the mix-up of Cavalry. And they were advancing into Belgium as the Germans were advancing into Belgium the other way. Both sides thought that the Belgians were still in front of them. The Germans thought the Belgians were still falling back um, in front of them, and the French thought that they were going to meet the Belgians coming back the other way and form up into a unified defense line. The Belgians had, in fact, already been overrun. So what this means is that both of these armored spearheads were advancing into a very rare kind of a vacuum, and they collided head-on, um, which, again, they don't normally do. Um, this was the overall area of the Battle of Hanut, which later developed into the Battle of Murdo, down here to the west. Um, we're not going to be doing this whole thing here today, because that would be, you know, much too large. So we've kind of... Uh, you know, trimmed it down, and we've drawn a little bit more of a tighter box around this, and we're just going to be taking a look at the small battle here around Murdeaux. We have one regiment of uh, Carassier, that's pretty much French cavalry, but again, we're talking about tanks here. Um, we have the remnants of um, 11th Dragoon Regiment. Uh, these are motorized infantry, uh, and a little bit of a regimental headquarters unit. These guys were formerly further north up here at uh, Crehen, um, and some of these other uh, towns up here near... Um, uh, near Hanut. That battle was yesterday. That was 12 May 1940. That battle's over. That's all these smoke clouds here in the back. And now it's the morning of the second day. The Germans are pushing further west and they're trying to, you know, break into this last uh, French uh, defense area. Um, so we have some uh, French infantry back here. These are pretty much just scraps. Some of them are half strength. You'll notice their numbers are a little different to, uh, to show that, you know, they've been through a really big battle yesterday and, um, you know, they're, they're kind of hating life at the moment. Um, however, we do have uh, some uh, French armor uh, that's kind of come up to help them. And again, this is what we see in the second day of this battle that takes place more around the town of uh, Murdeaux, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
The Germans are also a little worse for wear. Again, this unit has also been through a pretty tough battle yesterday. Um, they did eventually win, mostly through air support. And uh, they're lined up here. You know, we're ready to go. So we have the classic 1940 German tanks. I'll go through this all super fast. Um, Mark III's. This is 4th Panzer Division, so they're definitely equipped with Mark III's. Um, partially. Unfortunately for the Germans, uh, the majority of their tank force are still the Mark II's, which aren't so great. Actually, the majority of their tank force are the Mark I's. I didn't even bother putting them on the table. Um, <laughs> there's a huge pile of Mark I's uh, that I didn't even bother messing with. Um, and a handful, as in literally just two platoons of the Mark IVs, which are not really good at fighting tanks at this stage. This is way before we see the Mark IVs with the long barreled 75 in North Africa, in Russia, and then later on in Italy, Sicily, France. You know, what most war gamers are probably familiar with when they think of a, of a Mark IV. This is the old version of the Mark IV from the early part of the war. They saw that short barreled 75mm uh, howitzer. Uh, I'm sorry, Rasmus, you were going to say something? Uh, no, I said, uh, just said how, how it's... Uh, yep. Um, and the Germans have some infantry, some uh, some engineers, some pioneer engineers. So one of the better infantry units and Panzer leader are German uh, combat engineers. They're really good. Um, I don't get one platoon of those. Uh, the Germans do have some air power in the form of Stukas. But in a tank battle, these are surprisingly ineffective. They're going to be really good against this stuff back here in towns. Soft targets in towns. But they drop high explosive bombs, which aren't terribly effective against tanks. High explosive weapons are usually area of effect weapons, and in order to take out a tank, you have to literally hit the tank. And to hit a moving tank with a free fall bomb from a dive bomber is really hard. So that's actually that these six Stuka strikes look scary. Um, again, leaving aside these guys back here for the actual French tank force, they're probably not as scary as they look. Uh, what might be a little bit more scary are the, the German 10.5 um, centimeter batteries. Uh, of artillery. We do see that German 10.5 centimeter batteries are much more effective than French 105 millimeter batteries because all this French stuff is left over from World War I. Um, they have been slightly modernized, hence the model 1936, um, but they don't have indirect fire capability and again they still are basically World War I artillery. So the French army in 1940 had plenty of firepower, plenty of numbers, it was just all way too old. And not uh, not organized terribly effectively. Um, radios? We don't need no stinking radios. Right. We don't need radios. Radios are for, like, podcasts. We don't need that. Okay, so um, the French have two basic types of tanks here. Now, here's where the French do pretty well in this battle. Um, the Hotchkiss H-39 is an upgrade of the Hotchkiss H-35. They put a better gun on it. Um, You'll notice that that 5A2, that's the attack factor, the class, and the range, is better than most of the German tanks. Most of the German tanks are these Mark IIs with 2A2. So French armor was actually pretty good in 1940, sort of. Um, we'll get into that in just a second. These Samoa S35s, these are some of the best tanks in the world at the time. In certain ways. In certain ways, not so much. But the, the S-35, if you see a picture of the S-35, particularly its hull, you will quickly see that it looks a lot like a Sherman, those early cast Shermans. People uh, have sometimes suggested that the Americans saw the S-35 and said, that looks like a really good tank, we want to build our own version of that, and that's pretty much where the Sherman comes from, or at least certain parts of the Sherman's design. Again, not the welded ones, but those old, more rounded-off, uh, cast-looking ones. S-35 was a really good tank. It's got a great 47mm gun on it, which is a beast in 1940. I know that doesn't sound like a very good gun, but in 1940, that thing was a monster. Great armor and a good speed, too. It's got a speed of 8, which is as good as just pretty much anything the Germans have, except those, again, those Mark those Mark, uh, those Mark II's are pretty quick with a 10. Um, the only kind of disadvantage that the French armor has is, uh, again... They have a poor layout within the tank. Um, so that turret on the S-35 is, depending on the version, one man or two men in a turret only. So you've got the commander who has to also act as the gunner. This is also what you see in the early T-34s uh, later on in Russia. So a German tank turret has the classic, just like tank turrets to this very day, have three men, a gunner, a loader, and a commander, um, usually with a driver up in the hull. Um, 
But here, the French tank has only two men in it, sometimes only one, depending on the version of the tank you're talking about. The gunner also is the commander. Or I should say the commander also has to work the gun, which means he's not spending time commanding his unit. Um, in some of these tanks, he's also the loader. So he has to load the gun, aim the gun, fire the gun, command his own tank, command his comp his platoon, or even his company, all without radios, because he has a couple of signal flags in there. Needless to say, when you have this much work to do in combat, which should be done by at least three men, plus a radio, you are one man without a radio, you're not going to be doing the job very well. So, um, French tanks, while they had great armor, great guns, and pretty good mobility, especially these S-35s, you know, the classic three things you want to look at in tank design are mobility, uh, survivability, and firepower. Um, that classic three things that people like to talk about is very often a simplification. You, where are the radios? Who's the commander? Where's the gun? Is it in the hull? Is it in the turret? Is your turret really traversable? Is it fast? You know, there are these other little things like tank ergonomics that come in. And um, I only bring that up because that's where the French really get let down in their tank design, and that will be a factor in today's game. But other than that, uh, to kind of get things going super fast, uh, we are looking at, uh, again, a moderate-sized tank force on each side. I've already got us close to engagement range. We're trying to have a quick, fast, kind of a uh, you know engaging stream here by not making the battle too big or too involved really long approach vectors or whatever. These two units are basically already in sight of each other. They're ready to start shooting, or at least start maneuvering very quickly. And, um, yeah, I say we go ahead and get started. Yes. Awesome. So I'll be taking the role of the Germans today. Again, these two sides are more or less evenly matched. Um, however, the German side is a little more uh, complicated. When you're playing the Germans in a lot of war games, I've noticed this not just in Panzer Leader, Bolt action, I've noticed it. I've noticed it in Flames of War, especially, 4th edition. Uh, the German the German side ha has more... Um, special rules. Yeah, yeah, more special rules. So what I noticed at, like, say, the Flames of War 4th edition boot camp is we were running that campaign in North Africa, and the first round of the campaign, we had six games. The Germans lost all six games. German players lost six games, and the British won all all six games. Number two, it was like five and one. Game number three, uh, it was like I can't remember. It was like three and three. By the time we got to the last big mega game, we won like six out of six, or uh, we didn't win six out of six, but we won the mega game battle and um, like easily by like 12 campaign points or something. Um, and that's the German players getting used to all the special rules that make a German player make a German force really work. So, again, this is kind of a tutorial. I'm pretty sure this is close to, if not, Rasmus's first time with Panzer Leader, um, at least in a full game. For the first uh, time with, with Panzer Leader uh, as a full game in the uh, Second World War. Well, that's right. You, you were, uh, go ahead. That the one of the time I, I played Leroy Jenkins with some Abrams <laughs> tank. <from there. laughs> yeah, um, that, that was a lot of fun. Now, here... Those kind of tactics might actually work. Um, but, uh, yeah, in 1991, uh, I, everybody, before we get too much off topic, uh, everybody, uh, we had a uh, Tactical Combat Middle East. That's an upgrade that uh, Toshash Miniatures has come up with for Panzer Leader system that allow you to take Panzer Leader into the 1991 or the 2003 Wars in the Gulf. And, uh, yeah, by now you're playing with T-72s and Abrams. And the kind of maneuvers that you can get away with with Panzer III's and Samoa 35's, you really can't get away with um, with those other kind of tanks. The weapons are like, they have a range of 20. Um, here you have weapons with a range of 2 and 3. So the kind of maneuvers that you can get away with here, in fact, the kind of maneuvers that will probably be required here, um, you just don't really do in 1991. Um, <laughs> especially when the uh, victory conditions are as lopsided as they are in 1991. Here, it's pretty much just an even battle. Again, we're trying to keep things uh, nice and simple here. All right, so the Germans will start on turn one. Germans are basically the attackers. You know, we're obviously invading the country. So here's an abbreviated turn sequence for everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call in new artillery based on what I can see. So I have two batteries of artillery back here that do have indirect fire. I don't know if I can see a heck of a lot um, from any other unit... 
Do I have a little pointer tool or not? I may not have a little pointer tool. Hold on, everybody. Let me zoom out slightly. Yep, I do have a little pointer tool. Awesome. Oh, I zoomed in too much. Okay. So the reason there's a dot, I'd say this a million times, the reason there's a dot in the center of every hex, guys, is because that's what uh, that's what you can see. Uh, you always measure line of sight from center of the hex to center of the hex. That's why there's always a dot uh, in the center of the hex to help you out with that. Um, all right, so some of my guys can see some things. All right, cool. So the way you call in artillery, everybody, is um, if you have indirect fire artillery is, uh, you have to actually call in by a hex grid a turn in advance, at least a turn in advance. It depends on the scenario, but in this in this scenario, it's definitely just one turn in advance. So uh, normally you would do this uh, secretly. So let me see if I can have some other targets I might want to look at here. There's not too much else I can see. That little slip of water uh, dust cover. Um, there is line of sight there. Um, so, yeah, line of sight. Okay, so, real quick, um, Panzer Leader handles woods by, not woods hexes, but by woods tree lines. This is Panzer Leader and Panzer Blitz. So, as long as you're not going through a green hex side, like, there is barely a line of sight here. I can't see him to shoot at him because he's in woods cover. If you're next to a woods tree line, you're considered to be in woods. And you're not spotted until you fire or until you, uh, until I'm adjacent to you. So I can't see those S-35s, but I can see the hex they're, that they're sitting in. The problem is, if I call an artillery, who knows if those S-35s are going to be there next turn? Answer, probably not. Um, so I may want to call in my artillery someplace else. You call in artillery on a... Uh, Call an artillery on a um, which we'll call it on like on a hex grid, not on a unit, and you have to kind of predict. Um, ooh, wait a minute. You have to predict uh, where your uh, uh, you know where your enemy might be. So I believe or not, I actually have a couple targets here. Um, I don't know which one I'm going to call an artillery on. I can also call on any uh, artillery on any hex I can see, even if there's nobody in it, in anticipation of enemy units moving in there. I can also call on smoke shells. I can call on all kinds of stuff. So the point is, um, Rasmus doesn't know where I'm calling an artillery. What I'm doing now is I'm writing down my hex grid uh, for turn one. Actually, let me get a card. Because a card, like a 3x5 card, a 3x5 card I can show on webcam later on rather than a big, unwieldy kind of a um, legal pen. And that does not come in until turn two. So literally, there's a guy on a radio right now calling back. He says, grid, grid reference, you know, two, six, one, one, fire for effect. And they're going to fire in a spotting round. And then depending on how that spotting round lands, they're going to call in a full barrage. It's a whole thing. And in, in combat, it takes at least a couple minutes. And a Panzer Leader turn is usually only about six minutes. So the effect of that is it doesn't happen yet. You have to literally plan in advance. You can either pin down enemy units, you know, by, by calling them dispersed or pinned or whatever, and then call an artillery on them. You can call an artillery on them before that, hopefully pin them down, and then launch some sort of an assault. Who knows? Um, Panzer Leader is a game that definitely gives you a lot of choices. Okay, Rolling so that, barrage. Right. That completes uh, my resolve last turn's artillery. Actually, no, I had no turn from last turn because this is the first turn, so we're going to skip part two. We now go down to airstrikes. I have six available airstrikes for this game. Again, everything that the French have right now are undercover. Nothing is in the open. So right now my Stukas can't see anything. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip airstrikes for now. We go to direct fire. Again, everything is either too far away or undercover. I can't see anything yet. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, so yeah, we're going to go straight to uh, straight to vehicle movement.
or, yeah, we're going to straight to movement, you do vehicles first. Which is an interesting fact. <laughs> Movement rate uh, is the number in the lower um, right hand corner. One, two, three, four, five. Hopefully, I was undercover through most of that. In fact, I was undercover for most of that. Stacking limit in the game is three units per hex. I'm going to go ahead and Okay, vehicles are never, repeat, never allowed to move through a green hex side, unless it's on a road. Infantry, cavalry, you know, units on foot or whatever can go straight through a green hex side. They don't care. It's one of the advantages of being on foot. Like, okay, for instance, these, these two uh, platoons of, uh, these two platoons of Mark Threes here. One, two, three. I couldn't go straight through that green hex side. I had to go around it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, several of his units saw that, but again, it's just too far away. This is the kind of stuff you can't do in most games of Panzer Leader because you're usually playing with 75s, 88s, 17-pounders. Hell uh, yeah, they can reach at that distance. What about the uh, artillery down in the 33, uh, 13? He could see that, and um, uh, yes. So, the other okay. one. Which one? This one here? Actually, they, they both could see that, yeah. So the way Opportunity Fire works, I'll go ahead and do my movement again. One, two, three, four, five. Still can't see me. Six, seven. Boom. You could have seen at least some of that. Um... Opportunity fire works like this. You have to be in li enemy line of sight for at least one quarter of your movement. So fast units can go further than slow units. It's a, it's a, basically a quarter of your of your turn. One quarter of your turn or 90 seconds. You have to be in enemy line of sight for 90 seconds. Because again, everything here is at least a platoon or company or a battery. So it's a lot of captains talking to a lot of lieutenants, talking to a lot of sergeants, talking to a lot of privates, as far as getting a full unit to shoot at somebody. So it takes about, you know, at least 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds. So a quarter of your movement. Um, I did spend two uh, hexes here in enemy line of sight, so that qualifies as a quarter of eight. All right. He is in range. One, two, three. Cause that's not a woods hex there, is it? Or a woods tree line? No, it's not. There's no wood hex here. There's no wood line along this hex side. So this battery could see that. This battery could see that for at least some of the time. Uh, legally, yes. I don't know if I recommend it, because these are old World War One style um, uh, artillery batteries. They only have five attack, and they're H-class, high explosives. In other words, not tanks, not anti-tank, armor-piercing. So they would have to get divided in half. But technically, it is allowed if you want to take that shot. And if you take that shot, because right now they're in wood, uh, I'm sorry, right now they're in buildings, if you take that shot, you would be spotted. Yeah, so I think we'll hold the fire for now. But, uh, but good it question. Worth asking. It's totally a, it's totally a great question, and it, it, it uh, demonstrates how some of the rules work. They did see that. They did call back to battalion command. Sure, should we take a shot? Uh, maintain your position. Don't, don't, don't do that yet. All right, cool. Um... So I'm going to go ahead and do some more movement. One thing these Mark IIs do have is they are fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now you can see me coming down that road, so I'm, I'm, I'm again, triggering opportunity fire, but I'm not in range. If I move here... You would be in range. You would be in... I would be in range. And you would have a three but, uh, but again, that, if you took that... Sh now, okay. Another thing I have to quickly explain here. You absolutely cannot shoot at a unit that is not spotted. 
um, accept indirect artillery fire if you can see the hex, and even then there's a penalty, and etc., etc., etc. But for these Hotchkiss 35s, so as he's coming down the road, I'm spending more than a quarter of my movement rate in your line of fire. You're seeing me there. You just can't reach me yet. Because again, these hexes are 150 meters, and this is 1940 guns, and so on and so forth. So, um, now, Panzer Leader does allow you to take opportunity fire when the enemy is moving through woods or town hexes while they're moving. So you see me coming down this road, and even though while I'm moving, I'm in 2808, I'm undercover, I got, I'm next to a green hex side here, the, 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 this tree line, because I'm still moving, you can take opportunity fire, I do get a plus one bonus, because I do have partial cover. Um, once I stop, and you decide, you know what, when it's now your turn, you decide to go ahead and take that shot, now you can't see me because I've stopped. These Panzer twos have kind of come off the road, they've set up in those tree lines, and now you can't see them. Um, until I either shoot or you get adjacent to me, and that's the whole problem. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a chance and also kind of get the stream started here. If you want to take an opportunity fire shot at me while I'm technically moving. Uh, yeah, but I, I want to do it with the howitzer down in the city. Okay. Um... Awesome. That is uh, possible. One, two, three, four, five. You are in range. That's going to be two and a half, because again, your H class units, uh, H class attack factor against an armor target. It's only going to be two and a half against five if you engage one of them. So the way it works, everybody in the stream, is you uh, you take your attack factor, you compare it against the defense factor, you do a quick division problem, you arrive at a ratio, always around in favor of the defender, and uh, and then you know take your shot. Obviously, the higher the odds, the better you know. Uh, your your possible outcomes are based on a d6. So oh, these guys are okay. So these guys are closer. Okay, just just to explain your options, these guys are closer. They would have a total of 15 versus if they want to engage just one of them against five. That's three to one. That's not okay, bad. Okay, uh, let, let's try here, with those instead then. Okay, now you can combine fire. You know, oh. you, yeah, uh, yeah. This is not like Valor and Victory where you can't combine stacks. Trust me, Panzer Leader. <laughs> the rule in Panzer Leader is go for four to one whenever you can. Um, now, the only word of warning is that if these guys do fire now, that's literally their turn. They're they're taking their turn early. Opportunity fire is you're borrowing against your next turn. So now you are next to a tree line, so I can't overrun you, but you would be spotted. But none of my guys can reach you right now, anyway, so it's relatively safe. So we we will let them fire. I don't think we'll uh, throw in the uh, how it's a that is uh, as it won't to get it up to four to one. It'll keep it at three point something to one. That's so. correct. Yep. So yeah, it would be um, fifteen plus two and a half because again, this has to get divided in half. It's the wrong it's the wrong uh, weapons class. Three and a, uh, two and a half, it would be a total of 17 and a half against five, which is still three to one. So better to keep him under cover. This guy's gonna, these three platoons are gonna go ahead and shoot um, at two hexes. They are in range. Uh, you're on the three to one table, so you're on this row. Roll one d6, roll as low as you can. You will have to add one to the result because I do have partial tree cover. Uh, it'll be a uh, three then. Uh, with the plus one. Okay, rolled with two. with the plus one. So he rolled a natural two, that's right here, and then he had to add one because I'm in tree cover, but that's still an X. Okay, so for people in the chat, really fast, there are really three possible results here. X is a kill, D or double D is a dispersal, and that's pretty much like a pin or a disorder or you know the unit is damaged, it can't move, it can't fire, and it's more vulnerable to subsequent fire or attacks until it rallies. Uh, and then there's these dashes, which obviously are misses. Um, cool. So a 2 modifies to a 3. That is a kill. That is one German tank platoon burning. Again, everything here is at least a platoon. So we're talking about, you know, relatively large battles. This is five individual tanks, either uh, destroyed or damaged. And that puts a German wreck counter in that hex. Awesome, congratulations. For purposes, I guess. Oh, oh yep. Uh, and that is opportunity fire and spotted. Oh, man, hold on, I got some 
display driver problems here on my monitor. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and put opportunity fire on there. All right, so that reminds us that that stack has already taken its turn. Um, and I can now see them because they have fired out of that tree out of that tree line. So I now see that. Um, but they did blow up a platoon of German tanks. All right, cool. I'll go ahead and complete my movement. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm going to blow the crap out of that hex next turn. Uh, I can't fire on them now because yeah, you either move or fire, and we've already gone through the the uh, the fire phase. Um, when you move through 2110, can the uh, anti tank gun fire at you then, or when is I, it only at the? When I moved at through 2210. Uh, 2910. Oh, 2910. Um. If I didn't do that move carefully enough, if I was that dumb, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, yeah, did I move? Did I, if I move through 2910, yeah, you know what? We'll say I did. We'll say I screwed up. I really should have done this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But if I was being careless and I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which I probably did. Um, yeah, when I'm in 2910, you've been seeing me since 2710. You're not in range. Not in range. Boom, in range. You've now been looking at me for three hexes. That's over a quarter of my movement. And you're now in range. So you can kind of picture these poor uh, French 25mm anti-tank crews. They're watching these Mark III's move, that, move at them across a French meadow. And they're like, range 600. We can't fire yet. They're coming right at us. Prime your, prime your guns, man. Prime your guns. Range 450 meters. Sir, hold. Hold. <laughs> he moves into 2910 because the German commander's an idiot. Um, he moves into 2910. He's in range. You know, cut it loose. Drop the hammer on those fools. All right, so that would be uh, four against six. It would be a one to two attack. It wouldn't be great, but you might pin him down. If you wanted to take that shot. Because four is your attack? Yeah, but uh, why not? Okay. Now, that's one to two. Those odds aren't great, but I am in the open. So, rather than be on this row, you're now on this row way down here. Uh, so... Yeah, but, uh, never mind. Okay. Uh, five. <laughs> okay, uh, that's still significant because now I have them spotted. Oh, uh, yep. All right, and that's when uh, this German uh, tank commander is kicking his driver in the back of the head going, Why are you driving like that? You, you literally exposed us to unnecessary fire. And, uh, you know, Gunter down there in the driver's hatch is like, sir, it worked, didn't it? We got away with it. Yeah, because we got lucky. Alrighty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm gonna take I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a lumping there on your turn, but uh, that's okay. I, I think your display driver issue have now uh, hit the Skype. Oh, are you no are you no longer seeing my screen? Uh, I'm seeing it, but I'm seeing it with the auto artifacts on it. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ooh, that's ugly. Actually, you know what? Let me not do that. Because I don't have my other tanks set up in the proper position to support them. Alright, hold on. That's really annoying. Um, let me fix one small thing in Twitch to minimize that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, uh, give me two seconds here in... Uh, Adrian K, hello, how are you doing, sir? Gunter, I only do what you told me to, sir. <laughs> yeah, we're starting to roleplay our tank commanders a little bit. It gets a little silly. Uh, welcome to the stream, um, Adrian, over there on YouTube. Very glad to see people on different platforms. All right, let me just wrap up my infantry movement down here. A lot of times, guys, infantry are already in trucks. 
Um, but, you know, these guys were so close that I just said the hell with it. I just went ahead and put them on the map. Again, I'm not trying to have a super complex uh, game here. All right, so that will conclude movement. There was no... Um, we did uh, Rasmus's opportunity fire as he as he went. Uh, I then moved my non-infantry units, my, uh, my infantry. Uh, I didn't have any overruns, uh, and there are no close assaults. Close assaults are infantry that are adjacent to enemy units. Um, you can literally just go in there with, you know, shovels and bayonets and grenades, and you do like a classic, you know, close assault. Um, that's going to conclude German turn one, and now we will go over to Rasmus's turn one. Uh, 27, uh, 10, is that a uh, hidden or? Um, no. So it's if you're adjacent to a green hex side. So let me zoom in a little bit on that. That's a good question. Uh, no, he's actually in the open. Is the, is the short answer. So whether or not you, how you can tell whether or not a unit is in trees or not, and again, sometimes my Photoshop isn't the greatest. I draw these maps myself. But like 2409, one of the hex sides is covered in green tree graphics. It's undercover. 2410 is undercover. 2311 is not because none of its green hex sides have the have there's a little bit of green there but that's just like you know um splash or you know a uh, little bit of extra graphics here but none of the actual hex sides are covered in um the green tree graphics so it's that 2311 is an open hex and then rasmus's question specifically was about 2710 again none of the six hex sides are covered in green, I mean, there's a little bit of a scrap there, but don't worry about that. Um, so, so I tried to be careful when I draw these hexes, but usually they're pretty clear. Um, yep. As far as whether or not it's, uh, uh oh, I moved the world again. Oh, come back. Uh, whether or not it's, uh, it's you know, whether or not it has a tree line or not. But long story short, take your first shot. 2710 is in the open. So I can uh, actually see that, or oh yeah, he's uh, he's he's parked there, daring you to come get him, because he's got lots of friends on either side. Yep. You, you can't reach him with any of your guns, um, but if you charged him, he has pals that have something to add to the argument. Yep. Uh, then let's see what's going on down south. All right, I will zoom out so you can see the whole field. And because science teacher, have you, uh, is that, is that a message there? Is that you've resubbed or is that just me? Oh, never mind. If you have resubbed, we definitely appreciate it. If not, we appreciate, um, that you're on our stream anyway. Okay. That's pretty much the whole battlefield now. So let's be sneaky. And uh, take that uh, pile of hot kits down yep. south. Yep. All three of and, them? Uh, yes. All right. And uh, swing them uh, down on the road. Oh, cool. So that's one to move on the road. And now that you're on the road, you get double movement. And then uh, use the road to go all the way to 2417. So, again, for people in the chat, again, this is kind of a tutorial stream. One, two, he gets two hexes per movement point now because he's on a road. Three, town hexes count as road hexes for movement. Four, five. And that's 2417. Is he stopping there? Uh, yep. Okay, cool. Don't, don't want to walk up into an assault. I'll probably get assaulted anyway, but... Uh, yeah, go you're going to get assaulted anyway. But with three with three tanks in there, it's uh, you're, you're, you're pretty much okay. I say three tanks, I mean three tank platoons. There's 15 tanks there. So again, for people in the chat who might be used to other kinds of war games, every one of these hexes is 150 meters. Every one of these hexes is about an 8-foot, 28-millimeter, like, say, bolt-action table three or four of these hexes like in a little bit of a square would be like your average 15 millimeter um you know wargaming table so right here we're looking at 15 tanks that take up most of a bolt action table 
Um, and again, there's this is a small Panzer Leader game, and there's a lot of there's a lot of tables here. So um, again, uh, this is just so people have the right kind of visualization about what's actually happening here. And uh, then the uh, S35s will move forward to 2615. Um, okay, let me find the hex. So one, two, three, four. They do that easily. Uh, I have nothing that uh, I'm mean, gonna technically have these two guys, but I did not see you for. Okay, uh, let me explain this super fast. Um, the good news is, short answer is, I, I, I could not take opportunity fire while you were moving. And I will explain why as soon as I can find my stupid pointer tool. Which I don't know where the hell I'd put it. Because you you were blocked by the the boat in front of you. Yeah. Um, it is different from uh, the exact line of sight rules. Okay, I don't know what the hell I did with this. Let me find my... I think uh, I it is I think, over under the uh, table. I think I deleted it. But no worries, I'll just get another copy of it. Oh, I see it now. Damn it. All right. Literally saw it too late. All right, cool. Now I have two of them. All right, so uh, what I was looking at was this, these two platoons of Mark Threes. So again, he has to be in my line of sight for two turns. Where was this guy? Uh, these two platoons uh, 30, 14. are... Okay, um, 30-14. Okay, cool. So... Here's where Panzer Leader is a game of detail, okay? And it makes a difference. We're going to go through Scenario 1 here first. Scenario 1 says, 1, 2, he's trying to stay out of range of German guns, 3, 4, 5, I could see him and I could shoot him. He has to be in my line of sight for two turns, I mean for two hexes. So I could see him there and I could see him there. Even though he's still in trees, he's in trees, he was still moving, and there is a line of sight between those two hexes. So again, from center of the hex to center of the hex, I do see that. Scenario two. This is probably the one he's going to go with. One, two, three, four. He's actually a little bit closer to Germans, German guns, but ironically he's a little bit safer. One, two, Hi. three, four. Four. So the question is, can I see him in 2715? And the answer is no. Because unlike Valor and Victory, when it's an exact tie, as far as center hex, center hex, it barely scrapes by um, that actual black line, as far as what is in trees and what isn't, you always resolve, or you always resolve all tiebreakers, all questions, in favor of the defender. So, you're the defender in this case. You're the one getting shot at. I don't mean like the defender in the scenario. The guy, the, the target, I should say. You resolve in the target's favor. Um, so, if you go that way, you're actually safer. Now, yes. I, you only moved one hex in my line of sight, because I can obviously see you in 2615. I saw you for a split second. You moved into 2615, only for one-eighth of your movement. Not fast enough for me to take opportunity fire. Or short, not long enough for me to take opportunity fire. And now that you've stopped moving, you get the benefit of that tree line that you're next to. You're safe. Yes. That so, was the the idea. Yeah. This is uh this is where you know you pinch leader you gotta you gotta pay attention. <laughs> Little tiny details like that will make a difference. Because at that range, I would have at least dispersed, if not killed, one platoon of S35s, and those are your best tanks, easily. So we zoom out again. Oh, sorry. Let's see. How long to take one action in real time? Um, Adrian K asks on YouTube. Um, I officially a Panzer leader turn is six minutes, um, as published by Avalon Hill. I think that number is a little soft. I usually imagine at least 10 minutes, uh, if not 12, like double turns. And the reason I do that is because um, 
when you're designing like really like this isn't really a very tight historical scenario but when you're playing a when you're designing a really serious historical scenario like Omaha Beach dog green sector you want to know exactly how long it takes for certain things to happen between different assault waves and uh, things like that German reinforcements arriving I usually play on or I usually design to 10 to 12 minute turns and the reason I, I think that's six minute uh, a published time span for a, an action in Panzer Leader is is weird, is because of how they arrived at it, like for movement. They took how fast a tank could actually go. They looked up the number in kilometers per hour. They divided that by into six minutes, and they said that's its turn in 250 meter or 150 meter hexes, depending on the version of the game. Well, what happens when you can move and you can fire, and when is the time to? actually issue orders and for a battalion to talk to company for company to talk to platoon for platoon to talk to individual tank commanders in game design when you're doing command tactical games not WYSIWYG tactical games but command tactical games where every piece is a unit take the number take the amount of time it takes for a unit to do something and double it is a much better uh, estimation so uh, to answer your question a turn is really about 12 minutes of time and for the last movement, uh, I think we'll uh, move the infantry down on the, ro the road, down along the road. Okay, if they're That's just going to hump it out down the road, uh, again, they get, <coughs> excuse me, they get double movement on roads like everybody else. One, two, three, four. So anyone that plays Spanish Leader will instantly realize that, yes, I have doubled all the movement rates on infantry units. That's usually a one there. And again, the reason I did that super fast is because I play with 150 meter hexes instead of 250 meter hexes. That's also why only three hexes are allowed in the unit. Three units are allowed in the hex. There's a huge spiel about why I play that way and why I design scenarios that way. I won't bog down the stream. There are previous streams. If anyone's curious, we'll talk later. Um, but there are certain problems with the original Painter's Leader design that that small fix just imagine 150 meter hexes in the 200 instead of 250 meter hexes solves a huge number of problems um, but now that the hexes are smaller I increase the uh, infantry movement rate to uh, uh, to compensate for it okay so um, any other movement I think that's it for, for movement okay there was no uh, I did I uh, didn't really have any opportunity for opportunity fire uh, there were no overruns no infantry units are adjacent, so there will be no close assaults. We'll now move to German turn two. A Panzer Leader game is usually between 10 and 15 turns. I don't propose that we go through 10 or 15 turns here on the stream. Again, this is just a tutorial to kind of kick around a few uh, a few rounds. Um, we'll probably stream for like another hour or so. Um, but just to get a feel for how the uh, how the system works. Okay, so beginning of German turn two. This is good, because now we actually have a complete turn sequence. I'll go through it one step at a time. Um, <clears throat> call in new artillery. Now, I called in artillery last turn. Notice, this is one of the annoying, this is one of the things I love and hate about Panzer Leader in equal measure. Notice that you resolve last turn's artillery after you call in new artillery. You have to really plan. I've said this a million times, I'll say it a million and one. Panzer Leader is a game where you're always playing three turns at once. You're resolving last turn's fire, you're calling in fire that's going to land next turn, you're thinking about what you're doing this turn. So the turns are always kind of interleaved like pages in a book. You know, there's you're always, you know, thinking about at least two or three turns at once. Um, and that's true for a lot of games as far as like, oh, I have to plan what I'm doing two or three turns in the future. But in Panzer Leader, you have to resolve, you, you have to plan a lot. <laughs> More than most games. Um, but okay, for now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call in turn three's artillery. And I have to make that commitment and give that order. I have to write it down in secret before I resolve last turn's artillery. So I don't get to say, oh, that artillery mission failed. Let me go ahead and hit it again. I have to, if I'm really serious about that hex, I have to call on that artillery mission now, even if in 10 minutes I'm going to see, oh, that mission from turn two went ahead and took care of the target. Now I've wasted turn three's artillery. Hey, too bad. You know, it's a risk you had to take. Three. 
Let me not call out the number of my hex out loud so that Rasmus can hear it. Um, <laughs> okay, I have now written down my artillery from last uh, that I'm going to have in um, from next turn. So hopefully this will not show. Let me see here. All right. Oh, it's uh, it's blocking the number. All right, hold on. That's not going to work. Um, let me get another card here. Hopefully this will work a little bit better. Okay. So there is my uh, mission that I called in on turn one to splash on turn two. I was calling in on hex 3313. Okay, and of course right underneath that card is my t artillery for turn that I'm calling in on turn two that will splash on turn three. But I have that covered up right now because Rasmus doesn't know where it's coming in at. Um, so you write it down on a card or like a little chit of paper or something. You slide it underneath the table or underneath the game board in a physical game. And then when it comes to splash, you reveal it to your, uh, to your opponent. And you say, here's where the artillery landed. Now that was this hex here. I could see the hex, but I could not see the units inside. Um, so it's sort of a quote-unquote blind artillery mission. I could see the hex. So it's legal for me to call it in on the hex. However, the unit in there is not spotted. So he's going to get a bonus um, to resist this artillery fire. Uh, it's not really going to help him because this is a lot of artillery I'm calling in. Uh, two batteries of 10.5 centimeter howitzers. They hit on 13. Yeah, I have two of them. That's a total of 26. That's going to be 13 to 1 odds. Uh, he is in town, so he gets a bonus for that as well. He gets a plus 2 because I can't really see the units. He gets a plus one because he's in town buildings. Uh, he, he's, in, he's in light woods. Ah, light woods. Light buildings. Sorry. So light buildings are wood-colored building hexes. Heavy buildings are these concrete-colored and stone-colored uh, building hexes. So German artillery is coming in with 26 points. 13 plus 13. And they're going to land here, and they're going to land against each one of these two targets in turn. This is part of what makes artillery so effective, uh, at least off uh, indirect fire artillery so effective. And that's going to be 13 to 1 odds, long story short. I, I do have to add 3 to my roll, but again, I'm on the 7 to 1 table. It's technically possible he could survive, believe it or not, because I have to add 3. I, he, I'm a, it's a blind artillery mission, and he does have partial cover for buildings. I don't like the, uh, his chances, but it is possible. Um, one and three. Yep. All right, so webcam time. Cool. All right, so first for the truck that's in there, uh, the truck gets a five plus three is an eight. The truck actually survives. And now for the artillery battery, uh, the artillery battery is a four plus three is a seven. The artillery battery is destroyed. The truck, ironically, Yay. has survived. Yay, the truck uh, survived. <laughs> Yeah, oh man, that's that's kind of messed up. Uh, the truck is dispersed, however. So it's, um, again, pinned, for lack of a better term. That was a soft target that just was destroyed. So, um, oh, technically, same result. But technically, that truck is an armored target. I know it sounds crazy. But it's uh, it's tech if, you, if I expand the graphic a little bit, it's, it's technically a half track. So... Instead of being 26 to 1 odds, it was 13 to 1 odds because um, H-class high explosives are, are uh, halved against um, uh, armor targets. But again, my 26, instead of 26 to 1, it's 13 to 1. I guess, same idea, but just so that people don't think I'm uh, making a rules mistake here. Um, anyway, like I was saying, when this artillery battery was destroyed, it's, it's a, a soft target, so no wreck counter is generated. And that's it for my artillery. I have now called in new artillery and resolved last turn's artillery. All right, now we're going to go ahead and call in something else. That's why I moved those tanks forward. I was going to do... Ugh, damn it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, I am going to go ahead and not call in Stukas. Remember when my, when my uh, Mark III's were up here... Like right next to your S35s, and I was like, "Why am I doing that?" I remember now why I was doing that, but I changed my mind, so now they're not there. 
So, spoilers. It had something to do with my airstrikes. <laughs> I've kind of given that away anyway. Um, and I, I could call in airstrikes on these guys, because I do have them spotted now, uh, but I don't want to waste them on that. These tanks are a lot, or not a lot, but these tanks are slightly less scary, and I've already got German tank guns ready to do the job. Uh, German airstrikes are, are very useful, um, but you have a very limited number of them, and so you don't want to waste them. Ever. Oh, you could take out the uh, hot kiss uh, anti-tank gun. Oh, I've got plans for him. He's he, he's. I, I hope he's written his last letter home. He's he's already done. He just doesn't know it yet. Um, okay, that's yeah. where the next uh, artillery is like. <laughs> uh, I, actually, that that's where my Mark IVs are about to fire. Oh, uh, yep. Um, but anyway, for now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass on airstrikes for now. So I'll go straight to uh, to my direct fire. Ah, direct fire. Here we go. This is why I took those Mark II casualties last turn. And I didn't really cry about it. Point blank A class against um, armor targets get doubled. So these two Mark III's are read as 12's each. 12 plus 12. These guys are not point blank, so they just get their normal number. However, they are still in range. So it's 12 plus 12 is 24, plus another 2 plus 2 is 28 total. These guys are out of range. These guys are shooting at something else. So how do I do this most effectively? I have 20... F I have 6 plus... That makes 12. Plus 2 is 14. Damn it! I can't quite get 3 to 1 on 2 attacks. 12 plus 2 is 14. So 14 against 5 is not 3 to 1. You always round in favor of the target. That's only going to be 2 to 1. So this, I'm going to have to waste a little bit of money here. Uh, but that's okay. Um, these two are going to go ahead and fire. That's 12 plus 12 is 24. 24 are going to fire at 1 at 4 to 1 odds. Wouldn't it make sense to take one of the 12 and the two uh, fives? to 22 and then have a 12 instead of a 10 for the second one um does that make sense here let me think a 12 plus 4 is 16 at least i get three to one and then i get two to one on another one. that's not a bad idea the problem is i have to add one because you're in woods and i want to kill at least one platoon uh so if you say uh, 12 for for uh, panzer three Yep. And the two Panzer twos. Yep. That's a total of 16. 12 plus 2 plus 2 is 16. That gives, oh, yeah. that, that gives yeah. me 3 to 1 on 1. That's a good point. And then this 12 can take another one on at 2 to 1. It'd be 12 against 5. Yep. Um, that, that would be a good attack. Uh, it's it's not a bad attack. The, pro the, the reason I'm not choosing that is because I'm in woods. You're in woods. And I have yeah, to add, the plus I, one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 3 to 1, I only kill you on a 1 or a 2. I don't have that much faith in my dice. Even at 4 to 1, you have a pretty good chance of surviving. I'm sorry to say. But uh, let me go ahead and do this now. I'm taking the 4 to 1, followed by... Oh, God, a 1 to 2. Ugh. Oh, God. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and do it your way anyway. Okay, I'm going to take a 3 to 1 and a 2 to 1. I'm going to go ahead and take your advice. All right, so that is a kill on the 3 to 1, and on the 2 to 1, that is a 5, that is a dispersal. So we've got one kill and one dispersed. And one red counter. Yep. Yeah, what, what changed my mind was, as soon as I saw that my... Uh... Now, red counters, it doesn't matter what color it is. It, you know, red counters have no sides, but it's fun to just um, have the right color. Yeah, because then you get to look at the battlefield afterwards, guys. If you uh, watch our YouTube channel, check out part three of our Battle of uh, Hanut. That bottom part, that southern part of that map, has like 13 red counters, pretty much all like right next to each other. That was an actual tank graveyard. What's really fun, and it doesn't happen often. But is when at the end of the game you have rec counters of different colors in the same hex. 
That's literally like a bolt action table where tanks were 20 paces apart when they killed each other. That does happen. It, it's, it's not often. Um, now, it can't really happen at the same time in Panzer Leader, uh, but basically it's when, one, it's when the, the two sides are trading the hex, um, which, you know, results in intermingled wreck counters. That's a lot of fun. Um, but for now, that was our result. So these guys are now done firing. This, these two platoons... Are and they are go... now spotted. Oh yeah, they're now spotted. Now, H-class weapons are very, as we were talking about before, with these H-class weapons, H-class weapons are very poor against tanks. So that's why I didn't fire them against these guys. H-class weapons are awesome against soft targets. Especially when they're within half range. The range on those guns is 8. I am 4 hexes away from those batteries, which means they double. Each one of those 5s is now read as 10. It is now 10 versus 3. That's going to be 3 to 1 odds. However, I do have to add 1 to the die roll. Um, I have to add 1 to the die roll uh, because you're in woods. And I'll talk about defense factors in just a second. But right now, oh no, I'm sorry. That's two tens. 20 against 3. That's seven. That's not quite 7 to 1. Damn it. Alright, 4 to 1 odds. Uh, 6, he survives because of woods. Hey. Son of a bitch. <laughs> All right, so um, people might be looking at that uh, Hotchkiss. Again, if you ever get a picture, like you look on Wikipedia or whatever, you see the size of this gun. It's like smaller than most lawnmowers. Um, it's a 25 millimeter gun. It's basically a one inch rifle, anti-tank rifle, um, as opposed to like an 88, which has a defense factor of one, or these 105 millimeter uh, uh, cannons on caissons that read it's a two. They're like, why does this thing have such a high defense factor? It's because it's small. The bigger, more low to the ground. Yeah, the bigger a target is in Panzer Leader, you know, the more metal that's involved. People think, oh my God, look at this miniature. It's so big. It's so huge. It's chunky. It's gonna have an awesome defense factor. Panzer Leader says, eh, eh, the reverse. The smaller something is, the the smaller the defense factor. Or I'm sorry, the bigger the defense factor. So that's what saved him. If he was, if if I had taken that shot against this guy. Like, like, or I should say, if this battery was in there instead, it would have been 10 plus 10 equals 20 against 2. Instead of 4 to 1, it's 10 to 1. And, uh, yeah, he's a grease spot at that point. Because there's no way you're hiding that 10.5 centimeter howitzer uh, from me. But you can hide, oops, but you can hide quite easily that little 25 millimeter anti-tank team in there, as we just saw. Alrighty, so there's no opportunity fire there. Um... Because, you know, we're now past that in the turn. Okay, I think that's going to be it for my um, for my direct fire. Nothing else can really see anything right now. Or at least not see it and hit it. Okay. Um, down here. Okay, we're going to go over to movement then. We're going to start off with vehicle movement. Split move and fire. Ah, uh, cheating Germans. <laughs> Yep, cheating Germans who actually built radios and their tanks. Uh, that's when the uh, 3012 will uh, direct oh, opportunity fire on the uh, okay. Panther trees. That is legal. That would be 2 6 as you're moving through uh, 30, as I'm moving through 3010. Yep, and uh, right. might as well do the opportunity fire with the hot kiss added in. All right, the Hotchkiss cannot fire because he's pinned down. Uh, oh, 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 so I thought you meant the Hotchkiss anti-tank gun, sorry. I know, the... My bad. The Hotchkiss... Okay. The Hotchkiss tank. Yep, yep, Too many gotcha. Hotchkisses. Yeah, well, half, half the French defense industry was made by Hotchkiss. Machine guns, anti-tank guns, tanks. Yep. I think even aircraft. Um, all right, cool. So, cool. This is a good example, because this actually is going to uh, show a few things. So these guys are firing at two. You're within range, but you're not point blank, so you get normal sixes. So you get six plus six. This guy, however, is point blank, so he doubles. Ten plus six plus six is, what's that, 22? Uh, 22 against six. That's a sloppy three to one. Unless you want to shoot at both of them and try and pin them down. This is that classic, do I want to pin both of them or do I want to kill one of them? It's up to you. We'll just try to kill one. So that's going to be three to one. Roll uh, no bon no modifiers because I'm in the open. So just a straight out three to one. Hey, you're one. 
Cool. He gets another. Oh, that's a big tank kill, too. Oh, no. I don't mind losing Mark IIs, but Mark threes. That eats a big one. Damn you. All right, cool. That's what I get for being too aggressive. All right. Six seconds in behind my line. Yep. Now, I could say that that was intentional, because now I've drawn all that fire. Now all these guys can advance without having to worry about these two. That would be a load of bullshit, because that's the kind of thing you do with Mark IIs. They are literally scout tanks. And remember Patton's standing order to his reconnaissance troops. Drive down that road until you get blown up. That's how a reconnaissance works, especially in Panzer Leader. If you do that intentionally, which I did not do, if you do that intentionally, you do that with your recon tanks. You do not do that with your prime battle tanks. <laughs> so I'm not going to even sit here and try to, you know, front like, oh, I'm totally meant to do that. Uh, you totally fell for it. Uh, not so much. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and complete my split move and fire. Try to avoid some of this. Oops. Opportunity fire from the south. Again, I can only put two tanks in there because there's another group of tanks in there on fire. Physically, there's still 15 tanks in there. It's just five of them aren't responding to radio calls anymore. I don't know why. We've one lost, to one. We, we've lost contact with them. One to one. Uh, are you talking about uh, Samoas in the south out of 2812? Uh, yeah. I think I'll hold for now. Okay, cool. Um... Let me do some more. Okay, these guys did not fire, so they get full movement. Dun, 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 dun. One, two, three, four. So, interesting point, super fast. You'll notice that I am moving through this hex. And for a minute, there are five tanks in there. You might think that's overstacked. You're allowed to move through a hex like that. You just can't stop there. At the end of your movement, you can't have uh, more than three units in a stack. I don't know if I should do this, but if I don't, I'm going to have other problems. And I f oh, a little bit of infantry here. Get up there, quickly! Oh, those other two tanks have never moved. Damn it. Um, I should be more careful about moving my vehicles first. Okay. Uh, that will conclude my movement. Um, unless you wanted to take any additional opportunity fire. Which, legally, you should take as I'm moving, but I was going really fast, so no worries. Um, um, and you've been doing it correctly up here, so yeah, don't worry about it. I would definitely take at least some opportunity fire down here because you're facing a close assault. Oh uh, yeah, uh, we'll take our opportunity fire with the the guys on the road against the pioneers. Okay, so it's A class weapons against uh, soft targets, so they get they are halved. So instead of 15, you get seven and a half, which rounds to eight. Um, but you're still talking about a one to two attack, but, um, and I am in woods cause I am right next to a tree line there. So it's literally one out of six to disperse them. Anti-tank guns, tank guns are useless against infantry. Pretty much. You're basically using the bow machine gun, uh, to try uh, to pin down. Okay. So a two would normally disperse me, which would make a big, di a big difference. But again, I have that tree line. I'm attacking out of a tree line. Yep. So one to two. A uh, natural two becomes a three. That's a miss. 
If you'd roll a one, that becomes a two. That would disperse them, and that would make a pretty big difference. All right, so that's a little bit of opportunity fire here. Um, just to be, uh, just to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. I'll go ahead and put that there. Um, there was never really a chance for opportunity fire here. You only saw me for one hex. Because yep. I came in from, you don't see me until I'm adjacent. Um, you can never shoot through a green hex side ever unless you're adjacent. Once you're, we're literally on opposite sides of the hedgerow. It's like, hey, I see you, you German bastard. I'm going to take a shot. You know, then you can see me. But like this guy here, there's no line of sight between these two units, um, no matter what the range is. But once you're adjacent, yeah, then you can totally see. But you only saw me, quote unquote, for one hex. So no opportunity fire. Here, I moved half of my movement because the movement is only two. Uh, so you saw me for half the movement. You could see, it took a shot, uh, missed, although only barely. So I'm going to go ahead and take my close assault at this time. Yes. Only because I made these pieces and they're fun to do. And they also help with the battle report after the uh, YouTube uh, video. Sometimes we put battle reports up on ontabletop.com. Check them out, obviously. Uh, for those of you that aren't already on ontabletop.com, one of the best wargaming sites I've uh, ever been on, to be perfectly honest. I think most of you are already on ontabletop, but in case you're not... Uh, Chip Brenner, hello, what's going on, sir? How you doing? I did not see you sneak into my stream. You seal Team 6 into my stream. That's not fun. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, cool, so. Oh, Gaz, hello, how you doing, sir? Uh, I had to step back to the airstrike hit. Not sure I have just arrived. Jim is the bad guys, as usual, here. I'm almost always the bad guys. Um, the, the airstrike didn't get, get called, so that's yeah, the nice air thing. The airstrike did not get called because I vacillated on turn uh, or on turn one on my turn one movement so i didn't have the right unit spotted i could have called it in on another unit but i didn't want to waste it on that unit um but airstrikes are coming that's for that is for sure i promise right now we are doing a german uh, close assault with engineer support so these are guys with flamethrowers satchel charges this is going to be pretty awesome uh or at least i hope so all right, so I got a grand total of one, two, three infantry platoons, 150 men. This is your classic, like, Flames of War battle. So if you want to take these four hexes and kind of pretend that they're a square, this is a 15 millimeter table. This is what a 15 millimeter table looks like. And again, a normal Panzer battle is a lot bigger than that. But say this is a 15 millimeter table here. This is what we're talking about. 150 men plus another 50 combat engineers, 200 men versus 15 French tanks all within about 150 meters. Um, this is where, you know, this is the kind of battle that those kinds of games are trying to simulate. They definitely do happen. Uh, those kind of games are historically accurate, but th this is where it happens. A lot of times it's a battle on this scale, back and forth over thousands of meters, and you can never really put the kind of table on a 15 millimeter game board, but here is what those kinds of games are really trying to, uh, they definitely do happen. And it's just a slightly different kind of uh, sub-engagement. Speaking of it, let's go ahead and resolve it. One, two, three platoons is two apiece. That's a total of six, plus three in pioneers. That's nine. Nine versus 15 is one to two odds. That sounds pretty terrible. It is pretty terrible, except for two things. Number one, close assaults. You always subtract two from the dice roll. Because um, I'm literally running up on you, throwing landmines in the tracks, sticky bombs, the whole nine yards. Um... And I have combat engineer support. And whenever you do a close assault and you include engineers, you get a full odds column. So that one to two becomes one to one, subtract two from the die roll. Now, in full honesty, I have to add one back to the die roll because you are in a tree line. So it's woods, infantry, and combat engineers, French tanks, cats and dogs living together. And it's, it's, it's a madhouse down here. Uh, let's go ahead and see what happens. This is actually kind of like 50-50. This, this is going to be awesome, no matter what happens. All right, so on the one-to-one -one table, 
Uh, I was one to two. It becomes one to one. I have to net add one to the die roll. I get to subtract two. So net, I am subtracting one from the die roll. A one will kill you. A lot of other results will pin you down. So let me turn on Mr. Webcam here and see what happens. Deutschland über alles. A three becomes a two. Um, after all my net modifiers, that is a dispersal on the one-to-one -one table. Those three tanks are pinned down. But it's all three tanks. What's this? Yeah, it's all three tanks. I now have them spotted, and I know they're not moving. Artillery and airstrikes. Um, we'll see what happens. But for now... That is the end of the close assault. Close assaults always end the turn. That is going to be the end of German turn two. Uh, reply, uh, or no, replay, say hi to Gaz for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll relay a hi to Gaz for me. Gaz, Chip says hi. I'm glad I could bring you two together. I, I hope you have a long and, and very happy relationship. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, with gas, not so much. But with everybody else, I'm just kind of kidding around. Um, Jim is playing the bad guys as usual. Yeah, that's me. Because everyone else likes to play the good guys. No, in all seriousness, uh, we I built this game not knowing who was going to play who. But, um, again, as a, as a tutorial, the French are generally have a simpler rule set. The Germans have to worry about airstrikes. The French tanks are superior to German tanks. So if the German player is going to win this game, he has to coordinate with infantry. He has off-board artillery. He has airstrikes. He has to split, move, and fire rule. There's a lot of additional rules to kind of bring in. So for somebody's first game, it's usually a good first idea. First game. Yeah, for, for yep. first first you know, full game of Panzer Leader, it's usually the better. Uh, it's usually a better idea to have them play the. Uh, I don't want to say simpler side, but the side that has less rules, you know, involved with it. Just straight out more units or better units, um, like you know the French have, believe it or not. I know that sounds weird in 1940 scenario, but it's actually kind of true. Okay, so anyway, um, that's the end of German turn two. Over to French turn two. Yep, I think I'm going to be very light on movement. Well, yeah, there's a lot of uh, Germans like right up on you now. We, we, uh, got, yep, up, we, uh, we got we got up in your grill now, son. The, the, the only movement I really have is uh, down south, the infantry along the road. Okay. One, two, three, four. Again, a town hex always counts as a, as a road. There are roads in a town, obviously. So they are marching towards this continuing uh, fracas down here in the south. Okay. Um, actually, we slightly messed that up. Um fire goes first so don't worry about these two guys down here but fire goes oh. first and i bring that up is because rallies are part of the fire phase so first uh you've got a lot of point blank fire i'm gonna lose some mark twos i feel um and maybe yeah, i hope you will <laughs> <laughs> okay so, how do, does rallies work um okay rallies work as a d6 you want to roll as low as you can um, and then what you try to do is, um, is you have to roll that number or less, depending on your morale level. I didn't say what morale level everybody was. Let's just say everybody's morale B. Um, typically, German units in 1940 are A's or B's. French units are B's or C's, because the French army was just generally poor. However, this is a, a DLM, Division La Guerre Mécanique. Uh, again, my French is awful. I apologize for that. But light mechanized division, these are some of the best units in the French army. Uh, German 4th Panzer Division was not one of the premier Panzer Divisions, and they have been through a hell of a battle yesterday. F quite frankly, if you look up Battle of Hanut, H-A-N-N-U-T, 12 May 1940, it's one of the few times in 1940 the Germans kind of get their teeth kicked in a little bit. So, long story short, I'm just going to say, also for game balance purposes, would say both sides have a morale of B. So, morale of B is 1 to 3, you rally. You always want to roll low on Panzer Leader. Um, that's for infantry, for or infantry or... armor, it's 1 to 4. And infantry do get that bonus if they're in a fortification or an improved position, um, which I don't have on this table, so don't worry about that. Um, so pin down infantry, rally on a 1 through a 3. Anybody else rallies on a 1 through a 4. And that's not because tankers are innately better than infantrymen. Again, before anyone says anything in the chat. 
It's because if you have a tank crew that is freaking the fuck out, okay, the commander is literally right there. You're all inside. It's one. easier to hit. Yeah, you literally just reach out and kick him in the head. If you're out in an open field and your 40 or 50 platoon, 40 or 50 man platoon gets disordered, that sergeant has to run around and literally physically corral everybody back together again. It's a lot harder. Uh, so that's why they do that. That's also why the infantry get the full bonus when they're in a fort or an IP. Improved position is what that short's for. Um, that's like tr slit trenches, barbed wire, foxholes. You know, your infantry are just more brave. They tend to stand, you know, when they when they get scared, they don't run away because they're already in a hole. So it's easier you, for you the sergeant. Jump yeah, you don't jump out the foxhole to run away. Yeah, it's easier for that lieutenant or uh, that, that captain or that sergeant to, like we saw in part three of Band of Brothers, fire your weapon, Blythe! You know, he's literally just the guy's at the bottom of the hole, and you have to yell down into the hole and, and get him to uh, get back in the battle. So, uh, now that I've gone through like five paragraphs of exposition there, one to four is how you rally. Um, yes. And that would literally be that unit's turn, but that's part of the fire phase. So, the hot kiss... Uh... Tank. Okay. Well, the first thing we first thing we have to do is the uh, fire. You fire, and then you try and do all your rallies. Okay. So. It probably so doesn't make that much of a difference, but it's part of the de it's part of the decision cycle. Also, people in the chat will know me. I am a strict freak of nature when it comes to turn sequence. That's how a good game design works. The second you start getting a little sloppy with the turn sequence, um, you lose some of the game. So right now, these two tanks have to choose, or like, you know, these guys who are all going to be shooting, I'm assuming, they have to make those decisions not knowing whether or not these guys behind them will rally or not. They don't know what's going on. They just hear people screaming over a radio. But for now, we're going to do our fire phase. Yep. So let's go to down south first. And uh, let's see. Uh, those two will be doubled against you, so it'll be two to one. Add one to the roll for shooting through the woods. This is all correct. Yep, we're talking about these two here. Uh, yep. Yep, that's correct. It is two to one if you're engaging one platoon. You have to add one to the die roll. You can't kill me, however you can disperse me. Yep, and uh, then if we start to chuck in some of the guys above them, Oh, um, that is possible. That is possible. Give me two seconds here. I honestly don't know. Um, I don't know what keeps happening to my little, uh, where did I put those things? Okay, I found them this time. I keep losing my little measuring sticks. Center of the hex to center of the hex. I think you got it. Yes, there is line of sight between those two hexes. Um, it's extreme range, um, so you only get the six and not the and not the and not the, uh, and not the double. Um, but it's a Panzer two or Panzer three, so I get to take out instead of Panzer twos. Okay. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Okay. So are you gonna put all of them there or? Uh, so le let's see. Tw Twelve. Twelve. Plus six is uh, so, yeah, this is 18, one of the, that's three yeah, to one. Yeah, we're looking uh, at 12. So that's, you know, um, one to one, two to one. And if you put in two of these. Oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, no, it's two to one, uh, just one of the uh, yep, guys yep, down yep, there. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, one more is uh, three to one. Yep. Two more is four to one. So uh, four to one on the first, three to one on the uh, second. Uh, okay, One from the... yeah, so this is 12, 24, ah, I got you, I got you, I got you. And then, the, so take the 12 and then take two, two of the uh, sixes from up there. So that's going to be 4 to 1 and 2 to 1. Uh, and then take the 12 and the, one of the, the last one of them from up there. Yep. That'll be three to one. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Yep. So I got the four to one. Yep. A two. That is a kill, uh, even with a three. Boom. And the three to one, a five. Uh, that is a dispersed. Five becomes a six. 
Um, let me get my wreck counter in there. Sweet. It cost me shooting with the half yeah. the army more or less. But. Yeah, more than half, like two thirds of the army, but yeah. And again, Panzer Leader uh, veterans uh, might be watching on YouTube later are noticing that we're not having an extreme range. Again, with the ranges of two and three, the weapons effectiveness chart is a little different. Um, normally, a World War II tank doubles at one to two hexes. That's point blank range. And then out to half of its range, it's normal. And then from half range to full range, it is one half. Um, that's not how we're doing it here because, again, our ranges are two and three. You can't divide it that many ways. It gets, it gets dumb. Um, so the way we're doing it here, it's a little simplified because of the super short ranges involved here. Point blank, it's doubled. After that, it's normal. So that's why we did it that way. But normal Panzer Leader, it's a little different. Um, again, just uh, for people who might be watching uh, our, our tutorial stream uh, later on. Because then... someone, someone's going to say in the comments eventually, hey, what the hell, man? Those sixes should have been halved at extreme range. There's a reason we're not doing it. Don't, don't worry about it. And, uh, did we want to fall back out uh, uh, well, uh, the last uh, 835 will shoot to, at the at a one to one uh, plus one north of him into the Panzer II this, this uh, Samuel 35 here uh, uh, yeah. okay he gets 12 because uh, he's point blank 12 oh, yeah, against 2 12. So it's two to one. Add one to the die roll. Add one. Cool. He, uh, if he wasn't in woods, he'd be dead. But because he's in woods, he becomes dispersed. I'll take dispersed. Yeah, I tell you what, man. Sometimes dispersal is just as good as, as a kill. When you're the Israelis at Booster Ridge, fighting off pretty much all of, uh, like the bulk of an entire Syrian. Um, Tank division plus ninth motorized division. You want to because you're outnumbered like 15 to one. You have to disperse everybody, and then hopefully your airstrikes can kill them. Because you're not gonna you're not gonna kill them one at a time the old-fashioned way. And the uh, last bit bit of shooting uh, will be the 10.5 uh, shooting uh, at, okay. at a Panzer two. All right. Um, you are two hexes away, so you are no longer halved. Um, it's close enough we're out now where that artillery does get a little bit of, uh, does get a little bit of, uh, whatchamacallit. Um, I know there's a lot of these modifiers that sound very complicated. There is something in Pan's Leader called the Weapons Effectiveness Chart. I mean, right now it's just, oh, let's just trust Ariskin when he runs the game, and I'm going to go ahead and trust Excel to finally catch up with this. I think I zoomed out too far. There is a chart that lists all this stuff out. As far as when it divides, when it doubles, when it's allowed, when it's not, it's part of this uh, the weapons effectiveness chart. If I, I if I can finally show it, um, yeah. So here, the good news for Rasmus is that once you get close enough, an H-class weapon against an armored target is still normal out to two hexes. After that, it gets cut in half, like we were saying before. And that's just because once you get close enough, that howitzer shell is still going fast enough. Uh, even though it's not a dedicated designed anti-tank warhead, anti-armor-piercing -ar warhead, it's still got enough velocity. EK equals MV squared. You know, it'll, it'll still get through some armor plate. So that's five versus five. It's one to one. No other modifiers because I'm in the open. That's three. Uh, three. That is a dispersed platoon of Mark threes. I'm sorry, Mark twos. And we already know that he's spotted, so no worries there. Okay, so that's it for fire. We'll now try to rally your units that are pinned down. We'll start off at the top. Hotchkiss H39. Nope. Okay, 25 millimeter, 25 millimeter one battery. One. He does rally. Oh my god, there's Mark IVs right next to us. Uh, all right, uh, this little uh, half-track platoon down here in the town. Nope. Not yeah. five. And now the important one. Do I roll... Uh, do I roll three times for them, or yep. is it uh, all in one? Yeah, you roll three times because you can get mixed results. but you probably will get mixed results. Uh, one of them rallies, and then two six. All right, cool. 
that is going to be interesting next turn when we see a cat attack against a mixed a mixed snack. Some rallied, some not. Um, that's when you start getting some interesting results. Okay, so that's going to complete... F oh, no, not complete. Um, now we do movement. Sorry. I almost took away your movement. Now, you already moved those infantry platoons down in the south. Do you have any other movement from units you did not fire? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, in that case, we really are done with the French turn, too. Just wanted to check. Uh, unless you didn't want to move any of this stuff in your backfield, or... No? Just... Well, just... I... Uh, 34, 11, uh, move them up to 33, 11. Reinforcements. Oh god, I moved the map, did I? No, I'm good, I'm good. A little bit of Excel latency there. Um, yep, you got three units in there, so that's still legal. Cool. Alright. Um, yeah, that's a badly damaged, uh, previously... Uh, I should say a previously damaged uh, infantry platoon, hence he has slightly lower values than a normal infantry platoon. Um, and you're telling him to move out of... I'm just like having a joke here. You, know, you want us to get out of this nice, cozy church basement with stone buildings and move up to the front line with these crabby wooden buildings? Uh, okay, Oh, sir. yeah. <laughs> we went through enough of this shit yesterday, sir. Oh... Uh. It's only Germans. It's only Germans. Before the Germans get here. Alright. Go ahead and start German turn 3. German turn 3 is going to be epic. Alright, what we're going to start off with is... Uh, let's see, turn... I have to call in new artillery first. So... Oh, that's another... Turn four. Panther two lurking there. That that uh, Panther two lurking there in the uh, twenty four thirteen. Is that lurking or is that the uh, one that got killed? Twenty four. Hold on. Um. Twenty four twelve. Twenty four twelve. Oh, oh 24, yeah. 13. What the hell? Uh, let me see. I think, I think it might be the one that's from the red counter down there. Uh, actually, no, he's the one that I couldn't fit in there before. Okay. Uh, he, he's actually on Overwatch. So yeah, he, so, he actually does still belong So there. he is lurking around there, yeah. yep. I wanted to move him up here into this hex, but uh, he wouldn't fit. Actually, he still won't fit, because there's a red counter in there. But that's why I didn't pile in there. And there was, there was this was an open hex, and that was an open hex. So yep. yeah, he he's legit. He does actually sit there. Okay, yeah. Uh... Alrighty, where is my last turn's artillery? Where did I drop that at? Okay, cool. So what do I want to do with this turn's artillery? Wrote that down wrong. All right, cool. Get my little screen uh, card out here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm starting to lose my voice. All right, turn three's artillery that was called in on turn two um, impacts on hex three thousand and nine. So that is on that semi-dispersed platoon of Hotchkiss H-39s, good order H-39s, and wreck counters. My new artillery on turn four is already called in. Again, it's hidden behind that card. And uh, that is going to be um, my artillery phase. So here comes uh, some German artillery. 13 and 13, it affects everything in the hex, not an individual target. Um, that's the good news for the Germans. The bad news for the Germans is it's landing on armored targets, which means I have to divide it in half. So that 26 goes back down to a 13, because um, I'm dropping in both batteries. 
And so now it's a total of 13, but it affects both units equally. So it's going to be two two to ones is the long and short of that. And the uh, wood? Um, yeah. Are you in woods? You are. Yes, you are in woods. There's a little bit of woods there. All right, so I have to add one to the die roll. Good call, because I was about to make that roll without woods. Okay, so um, two to one on the good order Hotchkiss. A three becomes a four. He is now dispersed. Two to one on the Hotchkiss that was already dispersed. Now, you add one because he's in woods. You subtract one because he's dispersed. And a double D will kill him. That's the difference between a D and a double D on our combat results table there. So you see like those yellow and uh, yellow yes. and um, white uh, rows there. There's That's the difference between those two results. So on two to one, no modifier, and a double D will kill him. So basically a one through a three will kill him. Uh, here we go. And that is a three exactly. Uh, so that second tank is killed. So another red counter. Yep. That's the reason people play Panzer Leader. Stacking up red counters. There's just something kind of uh, fun about Therapeutic it. Therapeutic about it, yep. Yeah. Um, especially when you put a little bit of flames and smoke graphics in there. It's like, oh, look at that. It's actually not fun. There are people burning to death inside those things. But they're just cardboard counters. Actually, they're not even that. They're, they're virtual counters. All right, so that's it for my artillery. Now comes the airstrike phase. And yes, I'm calling in some airstrikes. I got to, Mr. Because there's no way I'm going to put a hole in enough of these S-35s. Alright, I'm calling in, uh, I think, all my airstrikes at once. I'm going to get this over I'm gonna get this over with. I have six total airstrikes, but once I use them, they're pretty much gone, except for their secondary weapons. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and use their primary weapons, which are their bombs. Sounds great. Unfortunately for me, they are H-class weapons, so they are all divided against armored targets. Yes, I'm trying to bomb tanks with Stukas. Not easy, but with enough Stukas, I might get the job done. So all these 20s are actually red as 10s. And the, the opportunity fire counters uh, are gone, right? Uh, yes, I will do that so we don't get confused next turn. Because we're now in my turn. Yes. Yep. All right, cool. Um, so these are all 10s. I have a total of 60 points if I want to use them all now, which I think I do. 60 points versus 18. That's not quite 2 to 1, or not quite 4 to 1. So I will do 50 points against 12. That is 4 to 1. Five Stukas are going to come haul the ass in there, and they are going to try and bomb um, two of those uh, Samoa S-35s. So that is going to be 50 versus 12. That's just barely 4 to 1. I do have to add uh, one for my, um, because you're in woods. So here comes Mr. Roll. And, oh, shit, webcam time. Uh, that is a 3. Uh, 3 becomes a 4. That is 2... S35, uh, S35 platoons destroyed. Ouch. Yeah, it, it, it is an ouch, uh, to be sure. However, on the good side, that is, that is all my airstrikes. Well, it was uh, five, five uh, Stuka counters, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go ahead just to kind of get it out of the way. Some players will, like, deliberately reserve, like, one or two airstrikes and literally just, like, psychological warfare against their opponent. They'll just, like, loom it over them. I'm just like, you know what, I almost want to use on my airstrikes, man, because it's fun. Um, I'm going to try and bomb that 75mm uh, battery, or 105mm battery in that town hex there. Now here, that H class is normal, because um, I'm dropping it on soft targets. So it is 20 against 2, it is 1 to 1 odds. I cannot bomb that, uh, that rifle company yet. That rifle company has not fired out of that hex, and I'm not adjacent to it. So that Stuka does not see the rifle platoon. He does see the battery, because the battery has fired before. Um, yes. So that's why I'm not bombing the. Uh, that's why I'm not bombing the rifle platoon at four to one. I'm gonna be a little bit wasteful here, and I'm gonna go ahead and bomb the. 
uh, bomb the rifle, I'm sorry, bomb that artillery battery at 10 to 1, which is basically 7 to 1. I do have to add one to the die roll for towns, uh, but I think even a 7 kills you um, at 7 to 1. So without even picking up any plastic, I'm going to go ahead and remove that battery. And now that is it for my airstrikes. These Stukas do linger. They do have four chances to hit with their machine guns. Their machine guns are one, though, as opposed to 20. And they're only I-class weapons. They are not allowed to shoot at tanks at all um, and anything armored at all. Uh, but they are technically still on the table for uh, a certain amount of turns. Um, they're just Where's my AA guns? Um, there, there really aren't any. Uh, French, yep. actu uh, no, but it, that's actually a good question. Usually, if you're going to put, if you actually look on an actual French order of battle table, the whole friggin' division, 3rd DLM, Light Mechanized Division, has, like, one battery. Oh, that's not even it, sorry. Yeah, one battery of 25mm anti-aircraft guns. Here's another one. Yep. So the whole, ba the whole division, 20,000 men, have two batteries. That's going to be, like, eight guns. Eight 25 millimeter guns. The French uh, army in 1940 was terribly uh, deficient when it comes to anti-aircraft weapons. So yeah, the Stukas had a field day. This is where the Stukas really got the reputation here in Poland, and it's really because they had no fighter uh, opposition and pretty poor anti-aircraft defense. The BEF have um, the Bofors 40 millimeter, which is actually pretty savage. Um, so the British are in a little bit better shape. And then, of course, you get to the Battle of Britain when the Stuka actually has to fight Spitfires, and uh, they don't do so well there, obviously. And that's pretty much the last time you see Stukas um, doing well. They have a little bit of a renaissance in Russia uh, in 41 and early 42, but, yeah, their days are numbered once they come up against a real Air Force. Once they come up against anything, they uh, got fighters. It actually can shoot back, yeah. Then it's... Uh, yeah. The, the, the Stuka was kind of obsolete even before World War II started. Um, I know it has this, this killer rep in early war. It, it, Spain, Poland, and a little bit of France. Other than that, it's pretty much... Uh, it's already an obsolete weapon. It, it sounded scary. It, it was pretty much half of its, uh, half of its mystique. Um, Alright, so that's it for my air phase. I'll now go to direct fire. Um... I do have some direct fire, not too much. I have two to one here, because the uh, the dispersed unit cannot shoot. So I have two to one here. Add one to the die roll for um, for woods. Uh, four becomes a five. That is dispersed, barely. Now here, we're doing a little bit better. These Mark Twos are pretty pathetic until they swarm up on you in numbers. Because now they're point-blank range, which means they double, and there's six of them. And they have a little bit of big brothers up here in the north. So these Mark II's are easy to laugh at. They're like ants, until you find yourself in a pile of them. And then it's like, oh, yep. these guys actually kind of suck. <laughs> uh, so I have six times four, uh, effectively, that becomes 24, plus another 12 on the top. That's a total of 36. Uh, six times five. Um, Six oh, oh, sorry. Six times four. I just read the counter wrong. Never mind. Yeah, me. no worries. Um, I'm going to go ahead and not shoot these uh, those Mark IIs because it's going to be a little bit wasteful. These six Mark IIs are just going to put a swarm of 20 millimeter gunfire. Um, okay, so everyone remembers Saving Private Ryan at the end of the, the, the ending battle in the French town when that 20 millimeter gun starts shooting at the American paratroopers climbing on the, on the uh, German tank. I have... 30 of those. Uh, it's the same basic gun in these uh, in these Mark II tanks, a two centimeter automatic cannon. Um, obviously, it's on a different mount and so on. So they're going to go ahead and open fire. It is going to be six times four is 24. That's exactly four to one on that central platoon of S35s. Um, so add I'm one. yeah, add one to the die roll. So there's there's no point in me throwing in this tank here. It'd be wasteful. So for now, I'm just going to go ahead and last away at these fools at uh, at four to one and one to the die roll and if that doesn't succeed i've got infantry cat attack coming up behind them so one of the big secrets of panzer leader is how you can stack up attacks 
You're only allowed to shoot at a unit once in a turn. You're only allowed to cat attack a unit once in a turn. You can only dive bomb a unit once in a turn. You can only call an indirect fire on... But if you do all those things on a really important hex or a really tough hex, especially once you disperse a unit and then right after that you do a close assault and they, therefore they can't do opportunity fire on your close assault, a negative one to the die roll, a double D will kill them. Panzer Leader is a game that allows you to snowball up these effects together with careful arrangement of the turn sequence. That's why sticking to the turn sequence is so important. You can really get cagey. And it sounds gamey, or at least it might sound gamey at first, until you realize what the game is really doing is encouraging you to use real-world tactics. You bombard the hex, then you hit them with tanks, then you bum-rush it with infantry. You actually send in you know, an assault once you have the enemy pinned down. That's, uh, that's kind of how it works. All right, uh, I'm just checking out the, the chat here. Hello, everybody, one more time. It's not your fault, Rasmus, they are French. Oh, come on now. <laughs> um, look at all these German burning tank counters here. I mean, he's not doing too bad, especially for his first, you know, like, you know real game of Panzer Leader. All right, so anyway, four to one. Here we go. Uh, a mass mark two attack. Uh, oh, shit, a one. All right, one becomes a two. That is toast. All right, and that's all them done. Um, this guy here... He's going to take a one-to-one -one attack on S-35, just try to pin him down a little bit. I had one to the die roll, so only a one or a two will disperse him. Four, that is no effect. No effect. Did that, did that. Up here, I've got some... Oh, God. Yep, down here, we've got some business to do. 20 points, again, against that seven. I'm going to throw in automatic cannon fire from this Mark II. It's an A-class weapon against a soft target. So it's only worth one point, but it gets me to 21, as opposed to 20. I'm trying to get to 7 to 1 table, because I'm attacking this 3 uh, anti-tank battery down here. So 5 becomes 10, plus 5 becomes 10 is 20, plus 2 becomes 1, 10, 10, 1, 21 against 3, 7 to 1 odds, add 1 for woods, even a 7, even a snix becomes a 7, that is still a kill. So without even picking up plastic, that is that. That's everybody fired except for this Mark Three here. That Mark Three will try to fire into that dispersed Hotchkiss and mop that up. Twelve against five, two to one. Subtract one from the die roll for being dispersed. Add one to the die roll for Woods. Two to one. A three or less will kill you. A five. He's still dispersed. He survived. Um, and that's going to be about it for my direct fire. I'll now go to vehicle movement. I don't want to be wasteful down here. One, two... Three again. I had to go around that. Uh, what's more called? I had to go around that tree line. Hold for now. Yeah, you don't have to. I mean, before we talked about, you have to shoot at a unit that's in trees, or else he vanishes. You've got a unit that's adjacent to them anyway, so you've still got them spotted. As far as the units I just moved. Um, also, that goes for them too. I mean. The, these guys fire, including tracer ammunition, into that hex is the real-world equivalent of the rules. The, in rules, as long as you have at least a unit that adjacent, can everybody can see them pending other, you know, line of sight, range rules, things like that. As far as spotting goes, they're considered spotted. Uh, okay, this guy here is going to try and fire at the dispersed tank. Did I, I didn't already do this down here, did I? I don't, I don't think so. Don't think so. No, uh, no, you you got caught up in the Stuga attacks when we were looking down there. So. All right, cool. Um, so it's going to be twelve on a two to one. No, no benefits, no penalties. Plus one, minus one, dispersed in woods. Two to one, against a dispersed unit. A one, two, or a three will result in a kill. Uh, that time I got it. That is the dispersed unit of S35s finished off. 
And that is going to be it for my direct fire. All right, vehicle movement, which I technically already started. Um, so they're done. Oh, before I do vehicle movement, rallies. Rally. This yep. unit here, a one, two, three, or a four, because we're morale B. A six, he fails. Um, Mark three platoon in 2811. He fails. Holy shit. What the hell, guys? Um, 2515, Mark three platoon. Finally. His buddy blew up those S35s. He's like, yeah, I can get brave again. Hell yeah, man. Let's kick ass. And uh, I think that was it. So everybody else already failed. All right. Um, now, finally, finish up movement. Get some of this decoration out of the way. Dun, 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 dun. He's short, so. Yeah, they, they can only move half. Um, oh yeah, the. Uh, but I don't know if I even, I don't even know if I want to move them too much. If I move down that road, they're going to get close assaulted. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. Also, I still have to mop up these guys. Uh, movement, movement, movement. Er, my gird. Mop up those things. How about uh, you guys move down that road and get close assaulted? Actually, right now, a close assault is illegal. It would be one versus five. You know what? I'm going to move the second platoon down there after all. Uh, no attack is ever allowed at at odds worse than one to four. Um, so I was not worried about it, but you have another rifle platoon that could move one, two, and do a close assault. So yep. just to, just to be safe, I'll send down. Uh, yeah, you, you don't want to in Panzer Leader. You don't want to send too many isolated units off doing their own thing because they will get isolated, chopped up, and destroyed in detail. I can't move into this hex because that stupid truck is, plog is clogging things up. These Mark IVs really want to get into this hex, but they can't at the moment. All right, Germans, it's time to get brave. <laughs> that's probably not a very smart move, but that's fine. Well. Uh... All right, that will be it for my movement. Uh, do you want to take any opportunity fire? Yeah, I was thinking of uh, that infantry, but uh, it's only going to be six against uh, two, isn't it? Yeah. Um, at the same time, though, uh, the, you're you're about to get close assaulted. Um, it's not yeah, it's not it's not a terribly good close assault. Well, yeah. And here here's your question: Do you want to or not? This is the this is a tough choice for you. It would be, yeah, six against eight, one to two odds. However, if you did get lucky, you would need a one or a two. If you did get lucky and dispersed one of them, he can now no longer close assault. Now I'm left with only two platoons, so it would be four against 12, which is still legal, but it's but, really, it's, it's really, it's really bad. Yeah, it's uh, yeah up, so it's, we, we might as well okay. take a uh, shot with uh, both of them. Cool. That will be, um, again, it's cut in half because it's uh, A-class weapons against soft targets. Six against eight is one to two odds. You need a one or a two to disperse one of them. Uh, would it make sense to, to say uh, no, because then it's uh, three, uh, yeah, that'll uh, put me in the th worst three, one. Three against eight, if you did two attacks, it would be two one to threes. So one chance against a one or a two, or two chances at one. Um... It's really up to you which way which way you go. I will uh, go go both of them into the top one. Okay, cool. On a two. All right, cool. That did disperse one of them. That will make a difference. Put them on the price here. Because now I went from uh, one to two to one to three, which is a pretty steep drop as far as likelihood that my cat attack will now disperse those two platoons. Obviously, I'm not going to kill you, but the German plan is to pin down these French units, which makes them vulnerable to German artillery. Yeah. When you can't move, that's when artillery... getting swamped by the uh, Panzer twos or... Yeah, that's true. If I pin them down, I can swarm them with Panzer II's. Um, Alright, cool. So that cat attack technically still does happen. It's just not very good now. So to close out the German turn... 
we will go ahead and launch a total of four points versus 12 points one to three subtract two from the die roll for a count attack no engineer so i don't get that column bump um however i have to add one back to my roll because you're in woods so we're looking at a total of one to three subtract one from the die roll i think i need a one or a two to disperse you not that I have this chart memorized or anything. Yeah, I need a 1 or a 2 to disperse you on 1 to 3. Webcam time first. And a 1. Holy shit. Okay, the Germans are just getting lucky now. I'm glad I made that roll on camera. Otherwise, Gaz would make fun of me. Of course, Ariskini you know, succeeds in his roll when the camera's not on. Alright, uh, and now the last cat attack is down here. Here I'm a little bit more hopeful because um, I got more units and some of those units are already dispersed. I still have to cat attack the entire stack. You're not allowed to selectively cat attack some of the stack. If you're invading enemy hex, you have to take on the whole hex, obviously. So again, I'm at 9 points versus 15. I'm still at 1 to 2. Becomes 1 to 1 because I have engineers. And subtract two from the die roll, add one to the die roll for um, for woods. Now, those dispersed units, I'm going to be subtracting an additional one from the die roll when I'm applying this result to them. And again, a double D will kill them. So it's still only one dice, but that dice is going to get interpreted differently for those two categories of units. The dispersed platoon and the two, I'm sorry, the undispersed platoon and the two dispersed platoons. But it all begins with a good die roll. And a good die roll begins with me turning on the webcam. So one to one, basically subtract one from the die roll net. Another one. Holy shit. Um, okay. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, yeah, that's going to be uh, pretty much, that's pretty much everybody's dead. Um, because now that becomes a one. Uh, I'm sorry, that one now becomes a zero. So that's... Yes. After all that rigmarole about different results against different categories of units, yeah, it's pretty much three rec counters. Okay, that was just a good die roll. That normally doesn't happen, folks. At least not two ones in a row. Yeah, those cat attacks uh, have kind of taken the... Uh... Well, it helps when I roll ones. They're not. Uh, they're, yeah. they're usually very effective, especially with engineers. I'm not saying that uh, it's completely unusual, but lots of infantry, no chance for opportunity fire with engineers, most of the stack already dispersed, and then you roll a one. Oh, yeah. that, it's a perfect storm. Oh um, yeah. Uh, that that's that that's not a typical result, but it, it does happen, and it feels good when it happens. But just don't 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 come to rely on that stuff. That concludes German turn three. Over to French turn three. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just now looking at your forces. Holy shit, dude! Uh, oh no, you've got you've got some marked, you got some uh, Samoas. They're under rec counters. Uh, yeah, uh, I got uh, two Samoas and uh, some infantry left. You got other tanks. They're just they're just dispersed at the moment, but. Oh uh, yeah. Cool. The, the... So not appearing in this movie yet. Uh... Well, we might as well take uh, out a uh, uh, a Panzer two. Okay, uh, we're talking about here in the in the center. Oh uh, yeah, shoot up. Okay, shoot north. That is going to be twelve versus five, two to one odds. On a two. Um, that is the dispersed unit at two to one. Okay. Um, you have a Samoa in the south. Uh, shoot at, at uh, one of the uh, heads of trees over there. Cool. Also two to one. One to one. Cool. Go ahead and knock him off of there. Double the red counters. Yeah, it's it becomes kind of uh, fun when you're just there's like a ton of red counters and they're in close proximity. You can just picture that battlefield in your head, and it's like, oh, death, carnage. Get to the top, so I can keep track of what the hell's going on here. Okay. Uh, and then uh, some rallies. Okay, we'll start here in the north with Mr. Hotchkiss, Mr. Hotchkiss, H39. He's back, uh, back in the uh, game again. 
two in the middle. Yep. Double four. Epic. They both rally. We're not scared of your German infantry. Uh, Mr. Half Track in the town. No. Yeah, that one doesn't really matter. If I've got to roll six to rally, that, that's the one to do it on. Yep. It was and much better to roll it there than roll it here. I'd much rather rally this guy than this guy. Oh yeah. That's when it gets that, that's when it gets heartbreaking when you roll a six on these guys and a one over here. It's like, oh my god, thank you, dice gods. <laughs> Not only do you give me a bad result, you mock me. <laughs> that's for uh, for movement. Yep. Uh, that uh, rifle group that uh, just moved forward, the ball yep. fall back. Yeah, he's like, oh, no thanks, we're out of here. Oh, yeah. All right, we have empty half tracks. Who they want to move backwards as well, or are you going to give me that town hex? Uh, no, that will stick around holding that uh, town hex. That's when the drivers sort of uh, take their their lunch out of the lunch out of the glove box, and they take their pistol out of the out of the driver's seat, and they say, "We're just going to park our half tracks like across the road, and then we're going to hide down in the cellar." Because. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh. And. Finally, down south, uh, if we move the uh, two infantry to 2318. Um, okay, that's legal. Uh, I don't know if it's recommended. Right now, they're in concrete building hexes. They're in a concrete building hex, and you want them to move into an open meadow and attack double their number in German engineers and infantry. Well, uh, would the infantry get involved? They can do uh, opportunity fire out to two hexes. Okay, yeah, so in that case, uh, just keep them uh, where they were. I mean, yeah, if, if... I mean, in this game, we're about to wrap up the stream anyway, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. But in a, in a, in a, like a full, like, ten-turn Panzer Leader game, if your idea is to sort of pin down this German infantry force, you can sit there and hopefully he'll attack you and get uh, embroiled in a street fight. Yep. If the German player does not oblige you and says, oh, I'm just going to start marching this way, number one, it's going to take me a while to get anywhere good. And so my movement rate is only two. And number two, if I do that, I open up the road back to my artillery park. So I may not want to do that. So yep. by keeping your units here, you more or less have this German unit it's economy of force. You kind of have the German infantry battalion, our company, uh, reinforced company, more or less neutralized, or at the very least tied up. Yep. Um, the only other thing they might do is they might close assault that Samoa S-35. So, but again, if they do that, they kind of open up the road. You know, again, you're not going to reach it in this turn, in this game, but uh, that's the kind of thing that, yep. you know, there's no right answer, but it's the kind of thing that you're kind of thinking about in your head. Um, yes. That uh, makes um, makes sense. Uh, I was actually thinking of doing it when the tank was still there. Uh, which, if they had ma made it at that point, it would have made sense because uh, you didn't want, wouldn't want to pull out the infantry when. Uh, but never mind. We'll just stick yeah, around the, where the, we are. The, the Germans in the the Germans in the south are. I mean, the French are holding on, but right now they're pretty much halted. These guys can't. They may have some options, but none of them are very good. And right now, we're kind of faced eyeball to eyeball here at one to one. So now, where the Germans are going to win are, are doing a little bit better in the center and in the north. Uh, but in, oh, the, yeah. in the south, things are, are pretty pretty stable for the moment. The first guy to, to blink, or so to speak, the first guy to, to lose a tank here, um, is is pretty much going to break our tank platoon is going to break things loose in the south. Um, but anyway. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so if that's the end of your movement, that would conclude... Um, My turn. That would conclude turn three. All right, guys, we've been streaming now for about two hours. Um, I was going to go ahead and call it for now. Um, yep. Because, again, as I, 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 as, as I continue to look at this, I'm starting to think this maybe scenario... Uh, the scenario wasn't too badly designed. I just rolled a couple really good results. Uh, yep. I, rolled, I rolled like two or three ones more or less in a row, especially on pretty important rolls. Um, the one thing I might do if I was ever to replay this was take out a couple Stukas or maybe one battery of German artillery. I would take out a little bit out of German support op options. Not a lot, but some. Um, 
but other than that, yeah, you've killed most of the Mark Threes. I think there's only there's only like two Mark Threes left, maybe three. Uh, there's uh, two down in the south and one in the north. One, two, three. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so there's four. I thought I I only put six in here. Okay, that's what I would do. I'll take out some Mark Threes. Germans have too many Mark Threes. That's that's what I would take out. German Mark Threes. The, the Panzerkampfwagen Mark III, this is the old D variant, the 37mm gun. This is only like 25% of the German Panzer Division tops. A full half of these Panzer Divisions are the old uh, Mark Ones and Mark Twos. Probably more than half. And then you've got a couple of Mark Fours thrown in there for good measure. And um, the Mark Fours are really only support. Yeah, the Mark Fours are, are... I love Mark Fours. Mark Fours are Stugs before Stugs became common. These are your infantry busters, and um, they kind of get laughed at in a lot of tank games, but most games are not tank games. Most, Despite the name Panzer Leader, it's usually some sort of mixed tank mechanized infantry force up against a defensive force, which is mostly tanks and artillery, uh, or sorry, infantry and artillery, usually in fortified positions, and that's when you want H-class weapons. Armored, mobile, H-class weapons. That's when your old school short-barreled stugs are worth their weight in gold, and these Mark IVs are worth their weight in gold. They don't do shit against tanks, but who cares? What you want to do is knock out infantry positions and fortified artillery, um, which is normally what an attacker is fighting against. This is an armored meeting engagement, which again does happen, uh, but it's more of the exception rather than the rule, historically. So. How did that do compared to uh, how the French did uh, historically? Historically, this is pretty much the result. Um, the Germans do win, um, but it does cost them. So, again, a super fast overview. These are... Oh, man, what the hell? These are the battles... I'll zoom in a little bit. These are the battles in question. So there's a meeting engagement at Hanut. That was the big battle I tried with Damon two weeks ago but there were internet issues and the game was too big. That was the full collision of two DLMs versus two Panzer Divisions, 3rd and 4th of 16th Mechanized Corps versus 2nd um, and 3rd DLMs of Purdue's Cavalry Corps in history's first real tank battle. I know that sounds crazy because, oh, tanks fought each other in World War I. Yeah, exactly once. April 24th, 1918, there were a total of four tanks, one German, three British. The entire battle on both sides would be less than one Panzer Leader counter. But technically, yes, tanks did shoot at each other in World War One, exactly once for about five minutes. Um, World War Two, there were some 7TPs, uh, Polish 7TPs that attacked Mark Twos in uh, some small night battles. So there was some tank, you know, versus tank battles. But as far as tank regiments, brigades, and divisions squaring off on a field and having a big Flames of War style battle. May 12, 1940 was the first time it happened in any kind of scale worthy of the name. Um, there were a total of about a thousand tanks um, on the field. It was the biggest tank battle in history. It held that title for about a year. Uh, then you have, um, uh, you have Brody and Romney um, in uh, the first couple days of Barbarossa. That was absolutely huge. And the, like the first two or three days of the German invasion of Russia, the Soviets launched a major counteroffensive in the south. Didn't go very well for them, but all of Panzer Group Kleist was involved in one huge battle. There were like six or seven divisions. And that was the largest tank battle in history. Uh, the tanks are all terrible, but just a number of tanks. And that was that held the title until Prokhorovka, uh, 12 June, I'm sorry, 12 July 1943. And as far as number of tanks on a single field, that's still the title holder. Um, there are two battles that came close. Uh, 14 October 1973 in the Sinai and uh, Medina Ridge in Gulf War I uh, came close. Um, as far as just number of armored vehicles on one field that you could conceivably see if you were on like a you know 10-foot tower or something, you know, all at once. Uh, coming off of that tangent... So this was the battle we tried with Damon. This develops into the, notice he's sort of overlap a little bit. I'll sh that is intentional. Then that develops into the battle of Murdo, which we just did. That's on the second day of the battle. That is 13 May. Now the French did give up the town of Murdo. Again, it took the Germans all day to, uh, to close it out. Um, 
It took the Germans all day to close it out, and they did lose a lot of tanks. Like, we do see some German wreck counters here. So as far as like how you did versus the French historically, about the same. The only difference is um, this is kind of the result. The Germans would have to at least get some sort of a foothold in this town by the end of turn 10. Which yep. I, I don't think that would be a problem, but again, this was the first game of Panzer Leader, and I threw a couple of really seriously lucky rolls. The Germans, I, I'm not even gonna. I mean, everyone complains and remembers when you get a bad die roll. Full honesty, guys, I threw some really good dice on this one. Um, so you know, I. You know, uh, what you would be looking to to do would be something like get the uh, Panzer Force in close. And then just blow the uh, infantry out of there. Yeah, it would take me... Well, I'm beginning turn four. Uh, spoiler alert, I have artillery landing. Um, my, my turn four artillery was going to land in on uh, 3311, which is uh, right here, which is now pretty much... You were very smart to move that infantry platoon out of there. The German artillery shells were already beginning to howl down that hex. <laughs> um, it would have been blind because I still... Actually, no, I did have those guys spotted next. My tanks moved right up there. So I could call in corrections. Um, so it's probably going to pace that half track, but who cares? Uh, so yeah, to, to get, to clear out any of these gray building hexes, the real building hexes, would take me until at least turn six um, to really get in there and close them out. I would do it eventually, but again, I got some really good die rolls. And I yep. probably gave the Germans one or two too many platoons, probably two platoons too many of Mark III's. Um, same number of tanks, I would just replace them with additional Mark IIs. Huge proportion of 4th Panzer Division was Mark IIs. Huge proportion, at least half, was Mark IIs, and even worse than that, Mark Ones. I just left them off the table. That's why this is the bulk of both Panzer Regiments that made up 5th Panzer Brigade, 4th Panzer Division. This is the tip of the spear as far as 16th uh, Motorized Corps goes. Um... But yeah, uh, the results are kind of the same. The Germans probably achieved it a little bit faster than they did historically. But again, that's just because I threw a couple of ones uh, in the dice box. But other than that, uh, pretty close to a uh, to a historical result. And then that sort of continues to develop from first battle, uh, Hanut, second battle, Murdo. Again, those two maps do uh, overlap. Do overlap. There is a reason if you go to the this is the full table. This is Hanut, and then if you kind of take that bottom corner, hey, look, it's Murdo. This this is our part of the map right down here. Yep. So yeah, again, 150 meters per hex. You look at the map, you figure out how many hexes are in a kilometer. You can actually scale these maps. This is a true scale of what this part of Belgium really does look like, or looked like in 1940. Nowadays, you look on Google Earth, which I did do, by the way. Um, what you will see is that all these towns sort of continued to grow and they got closer together as they continued to uh, yep. develop. Um, so the, the towns are all obviously in the same place, but they're all closer together now because uh, they've just all kind of grown, you know, further out. The low countries uh, yeah. where they don't know how to socially distance the towns. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're still pretty small. These are small town, like little like uh, villages, but... The, num the amount of uh, urban hexes that you would do if you were doing this like for a Team Yankee yep. table um, or for a modern Europe table, there would just be – the towns would be all in the same places. They would just have more urban hexes. The towns continue to expand outward. Uh, so just a super fast wrap-up. That then um, develops into May 15th, the Gambolo Gap, which is the really important one. Um, if I can find it here, that's his third one here. So there's Gamblow, and that's the gap between these two rivers. Uh, the Murs, famous for the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, I can't even read that town, uh, that that uh, that river hex. But that's yeah, the, they, okay. the they call it the Gamblow Gap. It's this corridor between these two rivers, and it's strategically important because if you continue to follow that corridor, there's a little bit of a canal here, but it's pretty much open country. That's why the French were fighting so hard to hold it. It's open country, and then you've got some headwaters of smaller towns, and kaboom, you're there at the uh, you're there at the uh, channel ports. And this wasn't even the part of the German attack that was going for the channel ports, but this is what leads into the back country of Belgium and what really starts putting pressure on these old World War One battlefields. Um, uh, Lille, uh, Ypres, uh, heading up towards Dunkirk, and of course we all know what happens at Dunkirk.
And uh, why the Brits got nervous and uh, started pulling back? Maybe yeah. too soon. Well, yeah, no, probably corrected because, again, BEF, yep. British Expeditionary Force, this is where they are. And as the French continue to lose more and more battles here and these German spearheads continue to push down through Mon and then further up into these old World War One battlefields, the British BEF's flank, their right flank becomes more and more unsteady. And, yeah, they start falling back through Cotrai, um across the... Uh, Across the Ezer River, and then they're back at Dunkirk before they know it. And yep. you know, we but then you know we know what happens there. Dunkirk, from this battle that we just did, Dunkirk is about two weeks out, and then Dunkirk lasts for like eight days, and that more or less concludes the first phase of the Battle of France. That's the Case Yellow Fall Guild, and then after that comes the second part of the Battle of France that not many people write about, but that's where some kick hey, ass. Right. Yeah, case right. That's where some kick-ass units start. First, it's what's weird. The French suddenly, like, I think they got some new commanders. I think this is when Patton comes back. They call him out of retirement. Uh, there's a little bit of a reorganization, a little bit of a shakeup. Uh, the, the, the Germans do have to take, like, two weeks off. They kind of pivot their armies around. They do some reorganization. And the, the French sort of made use of that time to study themselves a little bit. They've still lost. They still know they've lost. Because they just took too much damage in Case Yellow, but they put up a much better fight in Case Red. So, whenever somebody talks about how the French pretty much just collapsed and evaporated when the Germans invaded in 1940, yeah, remind them about Case Red. And uh, there are some battles there that are really awesome. That's when you come across some really good French tanks, like the Char B1. Those are even better than oh, those yep. 35s Yeah. Uh, you do see them in Case Yellow once here. This is De Gaulle. De Gaulle was a brigade commander. He wasn't, you know, a division commander or even a president yet. But uh, he, like, you know, a lot of people were just getting... This is where Rommel gets started in, in real... I mean, he was in World War One as well. But in, as far as a division commander, this is where he gets started. Montgomery is a division commander here. De Gaulle is a brigade commander here. Uh, Guderian was a corps commander here. This is where you see a lot of the more famous guys... In World War Two, this is, this is kind of yeah, this is kind of where they're getting started. Um, the big generals don't really make it, uh, like the big army and army group commanders, because they either are on their losing side or they get promoted where they're out of the army or whatever. Some of them are around, like Reichenau later dies of a heart attack. Uh, von Rundstedt is pretty much there until the end of the war. Yeah. But even a lot of these German guys don't last very long. They either die or they get fired by Hitler or whatever. Mm -hmm. List um, was around for a while. List was around for a while. Bach made it until uh, the end of Typhoon. He gets fired. Reichenau dies of a heart attack in December of 41. Kluge is huge. He uh, winds up commanding Army Group Center, and he's actually uh, half of the Battle of Kursk uh, until he finally, you know, bites the big one. Bush, <laughs> this poor guy. Uh, he commands Army Group. He, he right now he's an Army commander. He commands an entire Army Group in June of 1944, Army Group Center. And he has probably goes down in history as suffering the biggest single defeat that most people don't read about, Our Operation uh, Bagration. That was the big Soviet offensive timed with American and British and Canadian landings in Normandy. 22nd June 1944, Stalin delayed it so it could take place on the third anniversary of the uh, German invasion of Soviet Russia. And by... The, the end of like two weeks an entire army group has been encircled and destroyed so it's three to four times the size of stalingrad yep. um it's one army in stalingrad it's an army group in um uh, in uh, in, in Bagration. and bush was was the guy for that so good job there um yeah and some of these other guys i'm not sure of hote is one of my favorites his troops, uh, his that, troops. That, that's a name that I uh, heard somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not Hoth. It's not a. Co it's, it's not a cold planet in in Star Wars. Um, Herman Hote. They used to call him Papa Hote. Uh, he's a, he's a freaky looking guy, but uh, he's actually his troops liked him. He's actually pretty good. Um, Reinhardt, you hear a lot about, and of course you have Guderian, my personal favorite. Um, personally, kind of a jackass. Uh, <laughs> His his memoir is 800 pages of I told you so, and if only they'd listen to me. He's a little bit of a showman, a little bit of a salesman. Um, he he has a very high opinion of himself, but uh, not all of it is completely undeserved. 
He's the guy who didn't exactly invent Blitzkrieg, but he's the guy who put it in the field and made it work. Um, he's the guy that took it from, oh, I have a fun idea for a game. Let me play around with it on my, on my gaming table. I mean, we've all done that. He's the guy that took the game, went to China, talked to the guys in the factory, took it to Kickstarter, had a successful Kickstarter, took it to retail, and, you know, made a million dollars on it. You know, lots of people had the idea for mechanized warfare in the 1930s, and lots of people wrote influential books about it. Who cares? Guderian's the guy who went to Hitler, got the funding, bought the tanks, took it out in the field, drove them around in the mud, realized everything that the guys who wrote the books didn't realize, like, oh, you need radios to make this work. There's this thing called gasoline. Gasoline. Yeah, remember gasoline? You know, all the things that you might not think about when you're envisioning this in a hypothetical sense. He did it out in the mud. And then he took it into combat, which is something nobody did. I mean, even the Russians had some exercises uh, where they figured out how to do deep battle. This is Marshal Tukhachevsky and all those guys. Um, they just had the bad luck of getting wiped out by Stalin's purges. But, uh, so the British were thinking about it. They wrote some good books. That's as far as they went with it. The Russians wrote some good books about it and then actually put it in the field and learned how to use it in exercises. Then all the generals were killed by Stalin's purges. It was only Guderian who thought about it, developed the actual doctrine in actual exercises, and then took it into combat and won campaigns with it. Um, yep. That's, that's Guderian. Uh, then the Allies took it to stage four, which is... We didn't just win campaigns with it. We came back in 1943 and 44 and won a war with it. So that's why Guderian gets to sit there in the loser's box and write a write a book, as opposed to controlling Europe. And much better off we have with him sitting there yeah. writing books. He gets to sit there in his in his uh, his little house wherever he wound up uh, spending his retirement. You know, drinking coffee and writing a book. Um, meanwhile, you know, the Americans and the British and later on the West Germans are pretty much calling the shots in Western Europe for the next 40 years. So, you know, out of the, out of the four stages, Guderian stage three. Um, but even he wasn't that big a deal. Like I say, his boss is Kleist and his boss is von Rundstedt. And then von Rundstedt's boss at the time was, uh, Brauchitsch. So, you know, like, like with Patton or Montgomery or Rommel, these are the names that we remember. But again, they're only like mid-level commanders at best they're not uh you know war winning you know field marshals these guys are part of a machine and that machine has bigger parts and those parts are parts of bigger mechanisms and uh you know so on and so forth um and these maps do a good job of you know it's literally how big your box is and how many x's you have over your box you know you have bosses generals are like vice presidents at a modern corporation you're, just because you hit vice president doesn't mean you're king of the hill Vice presidents work for other vice presidents. Those VPs work for VPs, and there's this whole and hierarchy. Generals, then you've got senior VPs, yeah. so then you <laughs> And eventually you get to a CEO, but between the CEO and your beginning level VP, there's like four or five levels. And for generals, it's the same way. That's why there are five-star generals. Every five-star general, back when we had five-star generals, have four or five four-star generals that work for them. And they each have 10 three-star generals. And they each have a bunch of 20 stars, or uh, two stars. And those guys have one, you know. You have 100 guys before you get to your first colonel. Um, so, again, the, the point of that whole rigmarole is, you know, these commanders that we've heard so much about, Rommel, for example, isn't even on this map. Rommel is a small part, I think, of Reinhardt's corps. I'll have to look that up. Um, I know he doesn't work for Guderian, and he doesn't work for Hote, so I'm... Maybe he did work for Hote. I actually don't know. I'll have to look that up. He either worked for Hote or for Reinhardt. That actually escapes me at the moment. I'm going yeah, I'm, I'm to say it's Reinhardt, but I could be wrong. I remember the old uh, Panzer Strike from uh, SSI. Oh, yeah. One of the, uh, the first games in that uh, is uh, Rommel running into British Steel. Yeah, that's uh, Arras. That's a game I do want to do. I just have to make up some of the counters for it. Um, yeah, so Rommel. Rommel. Oh, Rommel. When am I going to get tired of talking about Rommel? Um, Rommel's one of those guys that, again, history has sort of just latched onto and catapulted him to a level that he really doesn't deserve. Um, I'm not going to say he was a bad was general. Probably a 
He was a great yeah, general. He was probably a good uh, commander down on this level. Yeah, he was an excellent divisional commander, sort of. I can I can make a make a, make some points against that. But he makes a, he's a great division commander. He's a great corps commander. But then he gets by 1942, he's like the only German general that's still like winning battles. So Hitler promotes him and promotes him and promotes him again. And even even Rommel was sick of it. After his Gazala battles, which is his crowning moment, it's his, it's Rommel at his high water mark. This is May of 42, May and June of 42 down in North Africa, like when he's really kicking the living hell out of uh, Eighth Army, like for real. First of all, he almost loses that battle because he almost outflanks himself, and I won't get into that, but he he almost he almost cuts his own throat. But after that, he does come out to win. It's a huge success. And um, even he was tired of getting promoted. That's when he gets promoted to field marshal. And he wrote to his wife, very famously. He's like, hey, I'm a field marshal now. I wish he had given me another division. I, you know, I, yep. I, keep, your damn, keep your damn promotion. Send me reinforcements. Send me fuel. Send me water. Uh, and again, he's one of those guys that, just get, that just get, gets promoted too fast. He commanded a regiment in 1939. By 1943, he's commanding an army group. And um, I won't go through the whole stack, but how many regiments are there in an army group? He goes from commanding yep. a thousand men to commanding a quarter of a million men in like three years. And a full-on front. Yeah, no one, no one's gonna, uh, you know, do well at that. I don't care how good you are. It's, there's a reason it takes you 20 years to progress that far in an army. Um, he did it in three years, three or four years, and surprise, surprise, he starts to fall apart. Also, he's up against the Allies, and the Allies in 1944 are nothing to mess with. I mean, but here... They're not different than the Allies in 1939. Yeah, two things go wrong. Um, they actually know what they're doing now, and there's 20 times more of them. So, <laughs> um, so Rommel, my man, he starts breaking through. He said, I'll have to actually look this up. He said the head of one of those two corps, either Reinhardt or Hoth, I think it's Reinhardt, but... Does anyone, does anyone want to check part of 15th Panzer Corps? I'm pretty sure that's Reinhardt. Part of 15th Panzer Corps. He was under Hote. Okay, I was wrong. He was under Hote. Okay, cool. So he's a little bit further to the north. Thank you. Uh, Charleroi. Yeah, this is uh, Charleroi. Mont. This is right around um, Waterloo. So this is just south of Waterloo, I think. Thanks, Chip. I appreciate that. I couldn't remember. Um, so he's up here a little bit further to the north. This is probably him, this, this red arrow here to Boimol, Philippeville, I know I'm mispronouncing all these names, and he just keeps going, and going, and going, and pretty soon Holt can keep track of him. Holt's like, where the hell is, you know, his boss, Kluge, is like, Holt, where's your Panzer Divisions? He's like, well, here's my 6th Division, here's my 9th Division. He's like, well, where's your 7th? The hell if I know. You know, they, I, they point to the map, where he's at, he's everywhere. Who knows where the hell he's at? So he started calling him the Ghost Division. Now, typical YouTube historians, <clears throat> or his history buffs, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's like, oh my god, he advanced so fast that they started calling him the Ghost Division because, you know, he was always... That, that was kind of an insult. That was kind of a put-down. They were like, this clown never obeys we orders. We don't know where he we, is. We can never yep. keep track of him. And surprise, surprise, I mean, it's all great to accumulate, you know, personal glory for yourself. Pretty soon you're going to need fuel. We can't get you fuel for your hundreds of tanks if we don't know where you are. Or if you've advanced so fast that there's now a division of British infantry between us and you. We can't get you fuel. We can't get you air support. We can't get you artillery support. A division is part of a corps, and a corps is part of an army. You can't just run around the French backcountry doing what you want. And as happened over and over and over and over again with Rommel is, yes, this caught up to him and bit him in the ass. He got so far ahead of himself that when he got all the way here to Ara. He gets caught in a, uh, what was supposed to be an Allied counterattack. This is, you know, the famous Battle of Arras, which is where, you know, Rommel supposedly invented the tactic of using 88s as anti-tank guns. He didn't do that. It was already done in Spain. He read about it in a book. Um, but, you know, he's, he gets attacked by these British forces. Now, here's what a lot of people might not know about the Battle of Arras. That was supposed to be part of a combined French and British counterattack. But the French, with their command structure being the way it was, built for World War One, couldn't get their shit together um, on the general level, on the on the colonel level. Um, so the French part of the attack never took place at all. 
and the British part of the attack underwent similar problems. You know, they couldn't get everything put together, so it went in with basically one battalion of Matildas and a little bit of infantry. So it went in at one-third power. So this is supposed to be three brown arrows, and the three blue arrows down here don't show up at all. So basically, Rommel gets caught by one-sixth of what he was supposed to get hit with, and he damn near lost that battle. So you can imagine what Rommel would be like if he got hit by what was supposed to happen, all six you know, elements of that main uh, allied counterattack. Both flanks oh, hitting yeah. a Ross. I promise you, you would never have heard of Rommel. That would have been the end of him right there. Or he would have been just another division commander out of hundreds in the German army. You know, put a gun another in my head. Another division commander that got too far forward and, and got, uh, lost the battle. Or just didn't really win. I mean, put a gun yep. to my head. Who commanded the 271st German Infantry Division? I know there was one. I have no friggin' idea who commanded. That would be Rommel. He would be a footnote of a footnote of a footnote. Yep. Uh, but this happened with, him, happened with him at Gazal. It happened with him at Battle Axe. It happened with him at Sunflower. It happened with him at Arras. He got too far forward. He should have been cut off and killed. And by some miracle, he made it. And because he made it, everyone thought he was a genius. And he got lucky, and he got lucky, and he was lucky, and he was lucky until he wasn't. And then finally he's like, oh, this guy Rommel maybe isn't, you know, so awesome. And I don't, I know I'm picking on Rommel here. I feel the same way about Patton. I feel the same way about Montgomery. It's these guys that history is just sort of... They're, they're, the great they're, man theory of everything. Yeah. It's, you know, did... Did the man make the times great, or did the times make the man great? And, you know, Rommel is definitely the latter, if you ask me. I'm not alone in that opinion. Amer a military heritage magazine in 2007, this is the American Hill History Magazine, went to Germany and went to all the German universities, the German military academies, like the modern-day 2007 Bundeswehr, and they pretty much conducted a survey and did a series of talks, and they said, German military historians, list your top five German generals of World War II. And they asked like a hundred historians and writers and authors and university professors and military instructors and so on. You know, people who know their shit, not guys like me who talk too much on YouTube, but actual like experts. And uh, Rommel's name did not appear once. It was Manstein, Guderian, Kleist, uh, Kesselring, um, you know, over and over and over again. And then some small tactical guys like ba uh, Balk is a guy you don't hear very much about. He was an absolute mastermind over there in the Eastern Front. Montafel, uh was a big time commander. He commanded the most successful German army in the Battle of the Bulge. He later went on to basically restart the German army in the 1950s. He was one of the big guys in the founding of the uh, Bundeswehr. He commanded, uh, he commanded Gross Deutschland, Panzer Grenadier Division in the East for quite a while. But these are the names that keep coming up. And honestly, Rommel's name did not come up once. Did not come up once, and it's Churchill uh, liked him. Uh, Churchill uh, liked him, and that's and that's kind of how he got famous. I uh, uh, He were running around the desert, so uh, he got a lot of Western attention. Absolutely, and he's not the only one. Um, you know, again, it sounds like I'm picking a lot on Rommel. Montgomery's the same way. Pardon? Montgomery, oh, definitely Patton. Montgomery won the Battle of El Alamein with the position and the army that Claude Alkenlake gave him. Uh, Claude Alkenlake therefore got all the blame for the defeats and uh, Monty got credit for the um, uh, got, got credit for the victory. Um, that's an oversimplification. Monty did do a lot to put that army back together, but it was the position, the El Alamein bottleneck that Alkenlake identified and set up and said, here's where we're going to fight and make a stand. The Germans attacked him. He kicked the crap out of the Germans, but it was already too late. Now it was back over to uh, to Montgomery. Montgomery beat him again on defense and then beat him on offense. And he got all the credit. Um, until he pretty much, his star pretty much fell. In the later part of 1944, he suffered two big blows to his uh, to Monty's prestige. He straight out lost uh, Market Garden. He got all the blame for Market Garden, uh, deservedly so. And um, he made some very, very nasty remarks uh, about the Americans after the Battle of the Bulge. And that didn't cost him anything militarily, but that was the end of him politically. And, uh, you know, as far as his popularity went. 
he really pissed the Americans off to the point where even Churchill kind of had to slap him back in place. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's way down the road. Yeah, all these guys. It's 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 a it's a balance between you know. They they aren't really as good as sometimes we like to uh, we like to imagine them to be. But uh, that was a really long uh, kind of a tangential discussion there. What I was really going to talk about was Arras, because that's a battle that I I'm, I have to make up some of the counters for it, but I do want to do that um, uh, here in um, you know, in 1940 Leader. We've seen the Belgians and we've seen the French, the third major army that we got to put together for 1940. Um, before our uh, our 80th anniversary window completely closes, or as the British Expeditionary Force, because that really is a very interesting army, and they do they do score some local successes. And Arras was very very nearly one of them. It really should have been, uh, but again, Rommel just got lucky sometimes. Yeah, uh, Roth, I, I would be be up for play, uh, playing because I remember it from when I was about knee high. Uh, it's a, it's a famous battle. It's it's uh, yeah. it's probably the one. If you put a pistol to most people's heads and you say, "Give me a battle that took place during the Case Yellow offensive," first of all, assuming that... they know what Case Yellow is, they'll be like, "Yeah, they'll they'll probably know Arras or they'll know Dunkirk." Those are yep. the two big ones that are most famous. And, uh, Dunkirk got all the movies. Yep. I tell you what, the French kicked ass at Dunkirk as well. Most people don't uh, write about that, but they, most of this French first army here, what was left of it, fell back until they got back here to Lille, to where a British officer, probably a little too, uh, a little too poetically, uh, characterized that battle as the French Thermopylae, and that was like seven divisions or so held up the bulk of this entire German army for like two weeks so that most of the beginning part of Dunkirk could actually happen. I guarantee you, two out of three people that made it out of Dunkirk owe their lives to the French First Army at Lille. And almost nobody says anything about that. Some of the other uh, British defensive actions at the Isser River, which I'm probably mispronouncing, uh, that gets um, attention or whatever back here along these canals and along this little river back here that sort of forms natural barriers before you get to Dunkirk if you're trying to evacuate out of Dunkirk. But the French did the real holding action back here at Lille. Like, seven or eight divisions, so like oh, like 100,000 men, held up a quarter of a million Germans. And that was uh, like two weeks. That was a hell of a battle. Um, so yeah, the whole idea that the French completely fell apart in 1940 doesn't hold up to real, real scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alright guys, um, so we've been rambling for quite a while here. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, everything looks great. Thanks very much, everybody, for swinging out and uh, checking us out here today on uh, Sit Rep Podcast for another look at uh, Panzer Leader 1940. Again, thanks very much, Chip, for saving me from a historical mistake. Uh, I could have sworn he was part of uh, Reinhardt's Corps, but uh, I wasn't sure. At least I said I wasn't sure. Um, but the chat kind of helped me out there. Yeah, he was part of Holt's 15th Motorized Corps later on. Um and yeah thanks very much uh gaz and because science teacher uh adrian chip everyone who's joined us thanks very much for erasmus for coming out and playing the french thank you absolutely uh that was not bad for a first game of panzer leader seriously panzer leader is not a light game it's not a popcorn and pretzel game it is a serious tactical uh exercise um and you're playing a 30-year veteran with the germans in 1940 so you know keep your head high keep your head high on that one I didn't expect to just waltz in there and uh, press the win button. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a win now. Thank you very much. ka mm-hmm. Not yep. only that, but 30-year veteran playing the Germans who designed the scenario and then started rolling one after one after one. Uh, it feels good after a while to actually... Uh, I've had a hell of a losing streak in Dark Star lately, so actually win a game feels feels pretty good. Cool. All right, let's go yeah, back. Thanks to... very much. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rasmus. Go ahead. Uh, have to get back and uh, play the uh, Japanese and the uh, Dark Star as well, but oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's a, there's some big updates there. A little off topic, but there's there's some serious. Uh, an, yep. an, 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 and by the way, even after my most recent thing, another faction has now dropped out. So even that update is no longer updated. Things are changing fast in that in that scenario. Um, cool. Thanks very much, Scoback, and everybody else I've Thank mentioned you. who uh, who joined our stream. 
we're going to go ahead and log off. Again, I know Sit Rep Podcast is kind of on a summer break right now, but we don't want to leave everybody completely in the lurch. Everyone's stuck at home during this whole um, quarantine thing. So we are trying to come out with at least a little bit of content every now and then, kind of keep the pilot light lit until we come back full stream uh, later on in the summer. Um, but for now, this is Ariskany. Thanks again to Rasmus, signing off. Thanks very much for everyone's support. Like, comment, subscribe, smash that like button, and all that other jazz that people like to say at the end of these videos. Uh, but in all seriousness, thanks, everybody. And I will be in touch later on this week. Take care, everybody. Thank you. So long.